Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you today to our festival of Christian pilgrimage. Many of you will know that 2020 has been declared a year of pilgrimage. Of course, a lot of those plans have to be modified um, because of the situation. And certainly when we were planning this event at the end of last year, this is not exactly what we had in mind, but we are absolutely delighted that we're able to have an online festival today. And thank you to our speakers who are really fantastic and we're so grateful they're joining us. I'm gonna hand you over now to my colleague, Sally. Hello, I'm Sally Welsh, one of the other, the other organizer of this event. Um, I hope you're deeply impressed with the background, my background, it's full of books. I would like to say that it's my study, it's not. We're in the Dean's study, socially distanced, of course, because this is the Dean's study and there is plenty of room in here, but we will be um, hosting the questions and things like that from here. Just to give you an idea of how the day will happen, the talks are pre-recorded, so we'll listen, everybody will listen to the talks first. And you will be able to comment um, using the comment facility. If you put, I've got a question, then I will be able to see the questions and we will be going after the recorded talk, going over to have a live discussion with each speaker after their talk. So if you have any questions for the speaker, write them down and then um, I will gather them up and make some kind of, I hope, intelligent and pertinent question to the speaker. I think that's, just about it, I'll just consult with my, anything else? No, we're good to go. We're gonna begin with our first speaker, which is the Dean of Christchurch himself, Martin Percy. A very warm welcome to you today to Christchurch Cathedral on behalf of myself as Dean and the chapter, and indeed all of us here at Christchurch to this inaugural festival of pilgrimage. Let me say right at the very beginning how glad we are that you are able to join us in this way. And although it's not, of course, what we originally intended, I'm particularly pleased that the organisation done by Sarah Merrick and all of our colleagues has meant that we've been able to welcome a great many more people online to this festival of pilgrimage. So thank you for being here. And I hope that the lectures and talks and conversations that will now proceed will be ones that you will find stimulating and refreshing wherever they find you. And please, at this time, be assured of our thoughts and prayers wherever you are viewing from and wherever this finds you. So I've been asked to talk about pilgrimage in um, a pretty general kind of way this morning. And I suppose I want to begin by just reflecting on what a friend and colleague of mine remarked very recently on their first, and I have to say, I suspect, last visit to the Shrine of Lourdes in France. It felt to him like religion had met with Weatherspoons and Poundland. As he remarked, there was simply too much tat on display to buy and more religious kitsch than you could shake a stick at. You couldn't get a decent coffee or meal for love nor money. And he said it reminded him of a, a fading English seaside resort long past its sell-by date in the middle of an economic crisis. The only difference in Lourdes being there was no sea to gaze at. I did ask whether there were any one-armed bandits there. And he said, no, there were no amusement arcades, but uh, it was pretty close. Pilgrimages are as old as the hills, quite literally. It's pretty likely that Stonehenge was a site of pilgrimage. Maybe the pyramids were too. We know that Jesus, Mary and Joseph went on pilgrimage to visit the temple. Chaucer wrote about pilgrimages. There are Muslim pilgrimages, Buddhist, Catholic, Protestant, pre-Christian, Christian, post-Christian, post New Age, Old Age, think saga holidays, pilgrimages that combine eco-tours, politicized trips to the Holy Land, and walking holidays to Santiago de Compostela for those who are really hardy and fit. Our medieval forebears shaped pilgrimages around the natural environment and the resources that they encountered. 
as well as celebrating potent reminders of the heroic individuals who had first planted faith in England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. Medieval folk regarded the sites of pilgrimage as a kind of matrix point of access to the divine. They were a network of places where supernatural power was regularly made manifest to human beings. One writer says they were like sacralized places of holy radioactivity, if you can imagine that, with the power of the spirit emanating from the fragments of the bodies of martyrs and saints, or by second, secondary relics of their activity and presence. And these sites stimulated a tradition of ritual journey, which was a defining feature of contemporary religious experience. Many people went on pilgrimage for reassurance and for solace. They went away for all kinds of things to do with healing and atonement. Some were just curious. And I dare say, if you follow Chaucer literally, some were along for just the ride and a rather good time. What the journey did do, however, was provide what one sociologist calls a therapy of distance. The pilgrimage was the external expression of an internal search for transcend transcendental meaning, a kind of extroverted mysticism, as well as a break from the normal routines and humdrum of ordinary social life, which was provided with convening excuses for social frivol uh, frivolity a kind of spiritual tourism, coloured a bit more by secular motives. And of course, they drew individuals from all kinds of different backgrounds, enabling people to foster what some anthropologists have called communitas, the binding together of a group of people who probably didn't know each other that well beforehand, but by the end were firm friends and bound in fellowship. When we look back at local sites of pilgrimage to the city and county of Oxford, you can find some pretty strange growings on, which show that pilgrimages were popular long before the Reformation and long after it. Crowds flocked to see the wonder-working springs at Binsey, dedicated to St. Friedwide, and they came to this cathedral to be near her mortal remains, which were held to have healing properties. This all produced a thriving industry then in tat and souvenirs, so pilgrims returning home had something to show for their journey. But even long ago, not everybody was happy about this. St Hugh of Lincoln in the 12th century attempted to suppress offerings at streams and rivers in Wickham, now High Wickham. He also complained about people who were spurred on by certain superstitious fantasies and what he called vain fabrications, who unlawfully venerated the utterly profane places as though they were sacred, and as he said, pretended miracles of healing had happened there. He banned in this diocese a spring situated in a field near Lindslade in Buckinghamshire, where many people of inconstant faith, he called them, went out of a sense of false devotion. In 1304, Hugh of Lincoln turned his attention to the parish of St. Clement in Oxford, at which people at the time were revering St. Edmund with such excessive enthusiasm and in a highly unorthodox fashion that Hugh thought this was contrary to the faith of the church and the doctrine of the apostles. Further afield in 1351, Bishop John Grandison of Exeter went to war on a Marian chapel in the woods near Frillstock in North Devon. He described that shrine as more fit for the proud and disobedient Eve or lewd Diana than the mother of God, demanding that the shrine be dismantled. He didn't mean that people were literally worshipping a false Greek goddess. Rather, he was getting extremely upset about forms of divination and fortune-telling 
they will perform there with particular enthusiasm and reference to the extreme lavishness of the cults suggested that people were engaging in practices linked with discovering the secrets of love and marriage by occult means or maybe it was just a kind of theological version of match.com in post-reformation norwich the bishop complained about the continuation of pilgrimages and celebrations around a relic of saint george the procession had been of course suppressed since the reformation Unfortunately, this left behind in Norwich in 1550 high, 1559 a very large pantomime dragon in the city. It was known as Snap. So the citizens of Norwich marched in gowns to indicate that they were the still protectors of its citizens rather than being linked to a dead medieval crusader. In Chester Cathedral, a more pragmatic route was taken in 1609. They'd also abolished their St. George's Day procession on April the 23rd, but they had replaced it with a regular annual horse race, which they dedicated to the Prince of Wales, which they thought would be safer. That just meant the Red Dragon was back with lots of flags and red crosses and processions and pilgrimages, and this time horses. Meanwhile, Back in Oxford, the waters of St. Cross also led to the naming of the parish of Holywell. In 1610, John King, who was both the vice chancellor of the University of Oxford and also the dean of Oxford at the same time, was prevailed upon to get rid of the, seven, uh, the severed quarters of one George Napper. He'd been hung in 1610 as a martyr and legend had it that he pointed towards some healing springs or waters near the site of his death, which were alleged to have healing properties for those who bathed their eyes in it or drank of it. This then prompted the then Dean of Christchurch, John King, to fill in the well and get hold of the last relic of Napa, um, an arm and a hand, and throw it into the Thames. However, Legend had it that Napa's arm simply rose from the surface of the Thames and pointed once again directly to the spring, of course with a barely re veiled reference to the nativity and the wise men, locals were assured that if you were unsure of the direction, there would be a bright shining star above the spring, which the poor Dean of Christchurch had of course by then filled in. Every time an attempt was made to fill it in, it was dug up by the locals and the spring sprang to life. More seriously, the Bartlemas Chapel in Cowley, something for our time, was dedicated to lepers, people who had caught diseases, who'd returned from the Crusades and also from pilgrimages, having contracted leprosy. Pilgrimages then to the Bartlemas Chapel involved flowers, greenery, offerings of food, and of course, gifts for those who were incarcerated within it. Particularly every Holy Thursday, we find people on pilgrimage processing to the Bartlemas Chapel to give gifts to those who were behind it. In 1630, we find one Lady Forster deciding to bestow 40 shillings to restore the decaying well in St Edmund in Oxford. Two fellows decided to rebuild the well ornamentally in stone after it had been damaged during the English Civil War. These were resources for the poor, for those who couldn't feed themselves or support themselves after national trauma. Pilgrimages, in other words, had a point as well. Sometimes it was all about banding together, walking together, in order to do some common good. Carfax in Oxford had a holy well that attracted pilgrimages for many years. And even after the Reformation, and in 1617, another benefactor by the name of Otto Nicholson 
also from Christchurch, erected an incredibly ornate structure over the systems bearing the arms of the city and the university and the allegorical figures of justice, temperance, fortitude and wisdom. So far, so good. But you may feel things went a little bit too far when he added eight other statues of what he thought were the worthies of his time. They were, in no particular order, King David, Alexander the Great, somebody called Edward of Bouillon, Ardaticus, Charlemagne, Hector of Troy for some reason, Julius Caesar, and then rather oddly, James I, whose inclusion was almost certainly just a vanity project. On the other hand, the destruction of a grove next to the Bartlemus Hospital in Oxford Cowley, which was attracting many pilgrims, was actually shut down by the fellows of Oriel College. Although, as one historian notes, this was probably driven more by plans for a housing development than by anything anti-religious or anti-popish sentiments. So then, as now, we find fellows of Oxford College's doing strange things with planning development against local popular sentiment. Protestants went on pilgrimage too. They went to the places that commemorated the executions of Latimer, of Ridley, of Cranmer, and we can find similar traditions within Methodism, where devout Methodists even now go on pilgrimage to look at the tombstone of John Wesley's father in Epworth in Lincolnshire, or for that matter, come here to Christchurch to stand near or actually in the pulpit where John and Charles Wesley both preached or stand on the spot where they were both ordained. In the gospel according to Luke, Jesus embarks on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem when he's reached the age of 12. He's taken there by his mother and his father and Luke tells us that he was lost for three days, but eventually recovered by his parents, who found him sitting with the wise men and confounding them with his wisdom. At the end of the Gospels, some women discover that after an absence of three days, they've gone to commemorate the body of Jesus. His body is again lost or stolen. His grave, which is, which is already assuming the kind of quality or mantle of a shrine, is empty. And the gospel writers all quite differently describe the resurrection and once more, the actual recovery of Jesus's body, his living body, leads to a deeper revelation. Jesus was lost, but now is found and found in a new, more wonderful form outside the tomb in the garden jesus says to mary magdalene do not touch me don't come too close although you're here at this sacred place we can meet and see the followers and family of jesus were blind but now they see there is that extraordinary sense that we find in the Gospels, the amazing sense in which Jesus is discovered on the road to Emmaus, discovered on journeys, discovered by people who journey to him and discovered by people who accompany him on journeys or when he journeys to them. We all know that extraordinary familiar hymn based on John Bunyan's Pilgrim's progress. There's no discouragement shall make him once relent. His first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. The Canadian philosopher Michael de Certin says that Christianity is founded on the loss of something, a body. By loss, he means absence but also presence, because the loss means there's no grave to go to for Jesus anymore, but there are shrines and memories of the presence of Christ being poured through 
the bodies and the bones of saints and sacred spaces and shrines, which are a touching place between heaven and earth. The function of a pilgrimage is transformation. It's about sacrifice, setting aside things, and walking and talking and fellowship, knowing that in the journey we gain. Christianity, as I used to say to Ordinands, is a marathon, not a sprint. It's not quick. It's about the long journey. It's about realizing that the constancy and presence of Christ and the power of the Spirit walk with us through the valley of the shadow, in life, in death, in love, in loss, in celebration, in praise, in desolation. Christian life is the pilgrimage, and going on a pilgrimage helps us to realize that in particular ways, in particular kinds of journeying, Jesus meets us and encounters us afresh, and we encounter him in new ways. That's what the story on the road to Emmaus is all about. Disciples have gone to Jerusalem. It's only on the journey home, when they get home, that they realize they have been with Jesus all the time, and he's met with them in the breaking of the bread. So sometimes using a retreat can give us a particular way of experiencing a pilgrimage. Something like what we're doing now can give us insights into the way in which the Lord accompanies on the journey. Ignatian spirituality offers insights into interior reflections that offer the prospect of discovering the Christ who is within us. A pilgrimage to Lourdes or to Nock or to Medjugorje or Walsingham can be concerned with healing or penance. A pilgrimage with friends or group or on our own can somehow mean that the traveling there and the being there allows us to reconfigure ourselves. Even more recently, just the business of going to revival rallies or festivals such as Keswick, New Wine, Greenbelt, Spring Harvest. These are also forms of pilgrimage. Okay, there's no shrine or holy relics or aesthetic building at Greenbelt or New Wine, but there is gathering, there is a journey, and these are related. Mary Rubin suggests that of medieval Christians, Pilgrimage was all about the creation of pre-political, undifferentiated human affinity, which dissolved the tensions and bound people together in space and time. Nicholas Lash, in one of his writings, talked about the difference between hollow spaces and holy places. But he added, even a hollow space is filled with a sense of God's manifest presence. If you've ever worshipped at Greenbelt or Spring Harvest, you'll know that even in a big tent, God's presence fills the space. So pilgrimages don't have to be about shrines, spaces or places. For many Protestants, God isn't in a place or in the midst of any particular shrine. It's in the praises of his people. Linking God to a place feels a bit constraining, even superstitious. But God is in mind, body, and heart. Spiritual value often comes through God meeting us in places that we have least expected. Second, I think sometimes pilgrimage is not just about what we find, but also what we're prepared to lose. The journey itself is often an act of faith. Spiritual burdens or petitions are left behind there. They're brought, they're offered, but they are, as it were, 
given over to God. I sometimes say the pilgrimages are all about lost property, things that we've been carrying for a very long time that we're now ready to give up. And pilgrimage too is a mixture of imminence and transcendence. God is in us in a journey, but with us in fellow travellers and with us in places or moments, in hospitality, in meals, in a shared drink in the pub afterwards. This intimacy matters. Pilgrims, attendees and worshippers all blend together by belonging together. At the moment, we live in incredibly challenging times. We live in what many regard as an age of anxiety. But I reminded that one of the phrases that Jesus uses repeatedly in the Gospels is, fear not, do not be afraid, it is I. Fear not. Jesus says it over 70 times in the Gospels. And sometimes the journey is simply an invitation to step out in faith. The pilgrimage is that simple word that Jesus utters to us all. Come. Come on this journey. Embark on this pilgrimage and see what good and grace and love and mercy I have to offer to all those who dare to take those first steps. In 1939, King George VI, on the eve of the Second World War, used a poem that was written by Manny Louise Haskins that she'd written in 1912 in a book called The Desert. Many will know these words. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. So I went forth and finding the hand of God and clutching it, trod safely into the night. Pilgrimages are journeys into the unknown. I cannot know what has brought you to this festival of pilgrimage, but God knows. Maybe your friends know. Maybe your friends, lovers, partners know too. However, I believe pilgrimage is timely. This place, this festival, Christchurch, is born out of journeying to seek God. Frideswide's shrine here is the birthplace of the cathedral, the college, the city and the university. It became a place of prayer, devotion, of healing, encounter and of pilgrimage. And pilgrimages like this bind us together. They bind us to the God who's journeyed to be with us from afar in Jesus Christ and in turn invites us to return to him. He came to dwell with us so we might dwell with him in eternity. Jesus comes to us on the road to Emmaus, walks with us in the pillar of cloud in the wilderness, finds us in the bush ablaze and speaks to us in the still small voice while we cower in the cave. I cannot tell you where your pilgrimage will take you. I can only promise one thing. God will be with you every step you take. God is with us in these, our times, even when all may seem dark, hopeless and lonely and desolate, because he is the Lord of the journey. So, welcome to you all on this festival of pilgrimage. May the Lord walk with you and meet you as you journey. 
May you meet with Jesus as the disciples met with him in mystery on the road to Emmaus. May you know his presence, his love, and his tender grace as you begin and end your travels. God is with you. He is Emmanuel. God with us, journeying to us even before we have decided to set off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Now, the next bit I thought was going to be challenging for me because I thought lots of you were going to write very many questions in the comments facility of your YouTube. And I, my problem was going to be picking out those questions and fielding them to Martin. However, it appears that you haven't asked any questions at all, but lots of people have been saying hello to each other, which is great. But if you've got any questions, they would be great too. However, I have, um, I have some questions. So in a way it's quite good because now I've got Martin all to myself. So Martin, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna start by the thing that struck me most which was your comment on Lourdes, hang on, I'll just quote this, which you, to be fair, it wasn't you, you were repeating the comment of a colleague who said that it was like religion met with Weatherspoons and Poundland. And on what level would you agree with that? Have you been to Lourdes? I've passed through. I mean, good morning. It's really good to see you, and um, uh, very good to be here. And I'm very glad we can do this pilgrimage festival together, uh, like this. Uh, just delighted. So, thank you to everybody who's made this possible and uh, facilitated this. Um, so, uh, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, before I was ordained and before I was an academic, I uh, was a publisher. And uh, I worked for a number of religious publishers, and that meant that uh, from time to time, uh, I got to see um, some uh, basically sort of uh, shrines um, throughout the UK and Ireland, which uh, had bookshops. And so I have a very vivid memory, for example, of going to Knock, um, which is an island which uh, celebrates the uh, appearance or the apparition of uh, some visions of the Virgin Mary witnessed by some school children. And uh, they now have an, the most enormous uh, sort of uh, cathedral dedicated to this as well, a huge car park and um, quite literally reservoirs, uh, I kid you not, of holy water. So the reservoir is blessed and then you can have the holy water on tap. And there's a very clear tap that states which is the holy water and which is the normal water. So you can fill that up at the tap. And then when you go into the bookshop uh, and the souvenir shop, it's, it, it's full really of what can only be uh, kindly described as religious tat. Um, a lot of it's actually, I think, very interesting and some of it's incredibly moving. But I've also discovered uh, similar tendencies, I think, at uh, Walsingham. And on my one trip through Lourdes, uh, I was uh, astonished, actually, to see all that was uh, available and that you could, you know, that basically you could buy. I have to say, I think in fairness, um, when you look back at medieval pilgrimages, uh, they were also great places for souvenir hunters. And even now, uh, from the uh, banks of the Thames when the uh, tide drains down, it's still possible sometimes to pick out coins of different value, which have been uh, clearly purchased from, uh, let's say, uh, some Friars Wise shrine here. And they would have increased in value the closer you got to the shrine. So if you walk, let's say, from uh, Canterbury to Oxford, and uh, you decided that you'd uh, call it a day one mile outside Oxford and just spend your time in a local hostelry rather than uh, spending the premium amount of money it might have taken to get into the city. You could have bought a souvenir that effectively said in, in medieval English, you know, I've been to Fry to our shrine, really. But the closer you get in, uh, the more valuable these coins are, really. But they were tat then, they're tat now. Do I... Um, 
sneer at that? No, actually, I don't. Um, I mean, quite genuinely, I think this is popular folk religion. It's for the people, it's of the people. It's uh, doing a really important spiritual job, actually. Um, you could sneer at this in a, a very classist way. I, I would really hope people would not, actually, because what it represents is uh, some bare token, and I choose my words with great care here, uh, a bare token like bread and wine, which reminds people that they've been to a place which has nourished them, sustained them, engaged them. And, of course, it won't be to everybody's taste. Some of it sometimes can seem... Uh, comical to the point of being risible. But what it's doing spiritually deep down is reminding people of a place they've been, a prayer they've said, and something that's deeply and profoundly significant to them. And many people watching this will remember that um, when you actually are in church, you very often have uh, kneelers or hassocks to, uh, you know, basically place your knees on um, when intercessions going on and um, in the past certainly when I've been preaching at churches celebrating one two five hundred years I've often encouraged them to pick up the hassock or kneeler and give it a really good squeeze and hold it to themselves uh, and squeezing it I think reminds them that this is almost like a sponge it's actually soaked in prayer that there have been Decades, sometimes centuries of people kneeling on these things with their intentions, with their prayers, with their needs, their lives, the whole thing. And to hold those things to themselves. And I think religious souvenirs do a similar job. Um, they may seem like impulse purchases at the time, but people will look at them over the years and be reminded of a place they've been and a time that's been significant to them and where God has met them. So much better than Poundland and Weatherspoons, in my humble opinion. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm relieved to hear you say that, actually, because I, I think the place of objects and things and souvenirs is that can actually be very important and a way, as you say, of reminding people when they are no longer in the place of the feelings, taking them back to that, um, the feeling that they had when they were in that place and the connection, perhaps, that they, they had with God. I have got more questions to ask, but but now other people are asking questions too, so I need to be a little bit unselfish. Um, just, just one, uh, somebody saying, that will the talks be available afterwards? And the answer to that is yes, they will be on our website about which we will speak later. Um, I think we'll also be able to address the issue of, there's a question about relating pilgrimage to lockdown and isolation, which you, which you might want to reflect on, Martin. Um, one of the interesting things you said was that God might not be found in place, but in praises, which given the fact that we are an embodied people and we are bound by time and space, I, do you just want to kind of tease out what you meant by saying, and also my concern is that when then widening a definition of pilgrimage out so that it encompasses almost everything, is there any way you can narrow down what you feel a definition, a useful definition of pilgrimage might be? Uh. Something, that's, uh, I think, about pilgrimage, which is of, 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 and that I think sense of our spirituality being something that almost the only person who can really reflect on it is ourselves. But we do it in company and in conversation. It's also something that's interpretive. It changes over time. Um, I'm very struck that one of the things that COVID has. Uh, given to us, I think, um, and I don't say that this is necessarily a gift, but um, it's certainly come to us, is some sense of uh, isolation, but contemplation and uh, being apart and having to get used to in a different way, being comfortable in our own skin and uh, largely with our own thoughts. 
conversations, I think, um, and the usual sort of social intercourse has just been much more difficult. I think there are consequences of this for the life of prayer. Of course, we miss gathering, we miss uh, uh, praising and praying together. And uh, what this time has done is, I think, pushed us back into ourselves, really, and remind us that actually we are in uh, quiet places, not necessarily desolate places, but, but quieter places. I think for spirituality, this has something to teach us about pilgrimage because it presses us into remembering that uh, Jesus himself took himself off into the margins and to the wilderness and to places where he could be quiet and recharge. Some of those times were forced upon him. Um, he didn't choose those particularly. They were just necessary for him to get out of all the uh, hullabaloo uh, that was going on and uh, the demands that were placed upon him. Uh, if you read the very early chapters of Mark's Gospel, you'll know that uh, after a particularly intense period of ministry, uh, very early on in Jesus' Galilean campaign, shall we say, um, he takes himself off um, either late at night or very early in the morning to be alone, to be still, to pray, to recharge. And the disciples, when they wake up, also quite early in the morning, um, realise that he's gone. And um, Mark says they went hunting for him. I mean, that's the word that's used, hunting. And when, of course, they find him, they say, we've looked for you everywhere. And Jesus' response is rather interesting. He says, hmm, should we go somewhere else? <laughs> so I think pilgrimage takes us off. It takes us out of life. It takes us into new places. But it takes us deeper inside to ourselves. It invites us to question what our journey is like, um, how the Lord accompanies us in that Christian journey, how we're being refined, changed, transformed, what are we leaving behind, what are we taking with us, um, what is God doing ahead of us in our future. Uh, fundamentally, uh, an inward journey, but a journey also that can be done in the company of others, but your journey is unique as much as mine is. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now getting more questions uh, coming through, some of which I'm going to answer really briefly myself because we're encountering them later on. So the question about applying pilgrimage to the local church context, I hope to be covering that in the last session of the day. So that's a really good incentive for you to hang on to the bitter end. Um, the bit about the history of pilgrimage and how far it goes back, Dee Dias will be covering, I hope, in, in her talk. Labyrinth's whole other festival, I've got to say. I'm very interested in labyrinths myself, but, but we're going to stick for the moment, I think, to kind of the mainstream bit about pilgrimage. So, Martin, could you say a bit more about your comment earlier? Spiritual value often comes from God meeting us in a place that we least expected. I think for many of us, we expect or hope uh, or imagine that, that God meets us in uh, goodness, kindness, gentleness, uh, peace, uh, so many things that are actually good in life. I think the striking thing about pilgrimage sometime is that we are bound to encounter God in uh, darkness and difficulty. It's not to say, of course, that God orchestrates, originates or sends the difficulty but it is simply to say that God will use anything, anyone, and everything, and everyone to speak through them and to us. Um, one of my favorite writers is um, an Indian Jesuit called uh, Louis Bermejo. Uh, and uh, he talks about how the Holy Spirit speaks to the church and changes the church. and he has uh, four C's for this, um, you know, sort of alliteration, really. Uh, communication, conflict, uh, consensus, 
and then finally communion. Now most people uh, expect and understand that God communicates to us. Most people understand that God is interested in consensus and we all understand that God meets with us in communion. But how many of us really, hand on heart, are prepared to hear God speaking to us or at us in conflict? Conflict between people in our churches, between you and your, let's say, clergy or uh, laity, uh, in your families, in your close relationships. The words of truth come to us through them too. This is not a surprising thing when you think about how the Gospels work. Jesus is constantly telling his audiences that God will meet them through despised Samaritans, despised tax collectors, uh, through the lame, through the uh, cripples, through so many other different people, through the unclean actually. So my plea here is for a, a wide, broad, spiritually and emotionally intelligent view of the goodness and imagination and vision of God to speak to us through things that we would genuinely and generally otherwise shun, maybe even loathe. So that's what I mean by by unexpected things that we would not naturally find active, but would find uh, possibly worse repellent, really. Again, if you think about this in the history of the church for the moment, to keep it a little bit abstract, we don't have creeds as the result of uh, a convivial afternoon with the PCC in which they sat down with a few ideas about who God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit was, put them up on a flip chart with some post-it notes and arrived at a satisfactory solution at the end of the afternoon. The creeds evolved over tense, difficult, highly acrimonious, even occasionally violent meetings, and that's how we got the creeds. We didn't get the New Testament any differently. People argued strongly and sometimes vociferously about what should be in and what should be out and what was important and what was not. I think what happens to us in pilgrimage is we sometimes discover not just new friendships, but we discover that frenemies, um, the enemies we thought we had, turn out to be agents of God's redeeming love. They turn out to be emissaries of God communicating to us. They turn out to be ways in which the Holy Spirit wants to teach the church. The lessons there in the Old Testament too. Uh, the only person to be called Messiah in the Old Testament is in Isaiah, Cyrus. Cyrus is not Jewish. Cyrus is a worshipper of pagan gods. But Cyrus is the emissary that Isaiah celebrates, who has actually brought redemption and freedom to God's chosen people. Now, if that's true in the Old Testament, it's true in the New Testament, where is it with me and with you? Who speaks the word of truth to us in our pilgrimage, who we dislike, who we would rather not listen to? The church, I have to say, generally, more on the abstract here, is not very good at this. We are uh, usually quite clear about who our friends are, and we're usually quite clear about who to resist. But actually, God is not mocked by this. God loves to confound the wisdom of the wise with the foolish and broken and base things of the world. So what happens is that God often uses things to shame the church. So the unexpected places where God meets us will be through uh, people that we did not expect to be walking with, people who were not welcome to accompany years on the road to Emmaus, but nonetheless tag along. People who are there at the supper as the bread is broken, who we did not invite to that feast. And if it was left to us, we would not invite them. But God does invite them. God does bring them along. And God will use them to refine us and teach us. Because in the end, God wants us to be more like him, which means broader hearts, broader minds, better eyes, open ears, receptive, 
being in the end like the body of Christ, becoming like him as we walk like Christ, because Christ wants us to become more like him. Thank you, Martin. And, and actually that resonates very strongly with some of the things I have learned while on pilgrimage when um, taking groups of pilgrims and secretly thinking as people sign up, gosh, I really hope that person doesn't sign up because I'm not sure I can bear to spend all day in their company. And then in a very humbling fashion, discovering so much more of them and the things that lie behind the way they speak and act as they do and and it being a real genuine lesson that that, that I have learned um, and also when you talk about meeting God where you least expect it in the difficult things one of my um, clearest memories is when we took the children when they were very small on pilgrimage and our youngest just sitting down in the middle of the road and going I can't go any further and us saying to him, um, you have to, because there is nothing else that you can do except just walk through this difficult bit and you will get to the end of your journey, but, but only you can do that. Um, I've got some more questions. Hang on, we have been slightly running out of time. There's been some of the comments being made about your referring to image memorabilia as TAD which I have taken just to be your shorthand for pilgrimage memorabilia. But um, I think there's some... Tat, are we allowed to call it Tat? I, uh, I, uh, I'll just say what, what I mean by Tat. I'm afraid 10 years um, uh, as a uh, theological college principal taught me that um, the... Um, uh, appetite for religious tat was um, almost limitless really and it never ceased to amaze me what ordinands would bring back from various shrines and pilgrimages really. Um, I don't use the word tat in a dismissive way, it's, it's my uh, collective noun for uh, all things uh, peripheral <laughs> that are brought into the centre and are uh, a wonderful reminder actually of uh, the joyousness and the humour of God, actually. I, I, I think some of them are just absolutely fabulous. And I've heard some terrific uh, homilies and sermons on um, anything from um, mugs that change colour when you put hot liquid in them, uh, to have Jesus waving at you uh, with your steaming coffee, and as you drain it, uh, Jesus gradually calms down, uh, right the way through to other things that you can pop in your car or on your fridge or something like that. Um, some of these things are actually, of course, intended to be funny. Some of them are not entirely meant to be taken seriously. Um, I don't think that should um, particularly surprise us. Uh, there's um, a number of things in Scripture exactly like that. Uh, let's not uh, forget that the Bible um, has humour, and the Bible also uh, contains things in it which we're actually intended uh, not to take entirely seriously because they're being either ironic or, or whatever else they may be doing here. Um, so um, I'm not a collector of religious tat, although I have to say a long, long time ago, um, I used to collect religious comics and tracts, and um, I still have some of those. And uh, I, I, I cherish them because actually, um, although they are now rather odd to look at, um, the important thing to remember about them is that they were attempts to communicate important religious truths through a medium that was incredibly popular at the time. Those mediums will change in 50 years and 100 years. But what we grasp now is the willingness and the risk of God to be present in everything, um, including the things that we find base or might amuse us. Thank you. Um, and you are not a collector of religious tact, as your study demonstrates, but you've got an awful lot of books, which may be serving the same purpose. Um, just before we go, we've got about two minutes. You've talked about pilgrimage as loss, pilgrimage as um, to be found not in place, but in praises, it being not about shrines or places or space. Can I push you? Just one last time, some kind of general definition of what what pilgrimage might be for 
start it with for you rather than forcing you to make a, a something that would stand for everybody. Yeah. Oh, that's a really great question. Um, some pilgrimages are unintended. Um, we uh, begin a journey in one way, and it's only as that journey continues that we discover God was actually taking us somewhere else and to a different place. And we had no idea. So some people set off on these journeys, sometimes in company, without realizing that actually God has something else at the end of this for you. Emmaus, I think, is a particularly good example. Um, you know, those disciples have been in effect to what might have become a shrine, a tomb, and it's only on their return and when they're home that they discover the meaning of the incarnation, uh, that God is at home with us, Jesus is at home with them in the breaking of the bread. It ends where it started, God in the midst of us, in our homes. I think I'm very struck by the fact that pilgrimages are um, beautifully disruptive of our spiritual lives. They are actually breaking the ground within us in a way that is good. Usually the force of physical movement complements our spiritual movement. Usually what then takes place is as the ground is broken, we see things afresh and new things uh, begin to take root and shoot up and grow. So for me, pilgrimage is acknowledging that the whole of our Christian life is a journey. It's a journey in which God was present at the beginning and during and right at the very end. But it is only by stepping out with God and being prepared to hold, as it were, that um, hand of Christ stepping into the future that we really encounter the light. Fundamentally, in the end, I suppose I would say pilgrimage is that deep reminder that God is never finished with us. Never. God never gives up loving us. God never gives up refining us. God never gives up trying to perfect us. But in all of that, we are comprehensively and universally loved. And so what else is there to do other than step forward and walk with Christ? Pilgrimage is, in the end, just that, taking us to the place of encounter where we will be transformed and changed, sending us home again, and reminding us that the journey is ongoing, that even when we've arrived at home, we are asked to refresh ourselves, but then rise up and walk to where God is leading us next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, we've come to the end of this first session. We now have a break. We'll be back at 10.45 with the Arch, Archbishop of York, with the Archbishop of York. I am asked to remind you that the um, Church Times Bookshop is open. So go wild. And we'll see you in 15 minutes.
Good morning and a particular welcome if you've only just joined us at our Festival of Pilgrimage today. It gives me very great pleasure to welcome Stephen Cottrell, the Archbishop of York. Amongst many other claims to fame, it surely goes without saying that he is, to date at least, the only Archbishop of York to have been confirmed by Zoom. I had already invited uh, Stephen to speak to us um, at this event towards the end of last year, before the news came of his new appointment to York. And I will confess that within about 30 seconds of seeing the news of his appointment on Twitter, I messaged him just to check that he would still be able to join us today. And I'm really pleased um, that he said yes and that he is here this morning. So, Archbishop Stephen, over to you. Brothers, it's great to be with you today. I'm really sorry that I'm not with you in person and I'm just speaking to you like this. Um, but maybe that is the first thing we need to learn about pilgrimage at the moment. It's quite hard to go on pilgrimage. Um, for years, uh, I found myself uh, seeing, when I gave talks about pilgrimage, I found myself saying, hey, we must be the first generation of, uh, of Christians who think that pilgrimage is about uh, arriving rather than traveling. What, what I mean by that is, so many churches now say we're going to have a parish pilgrimage. What they mean by that is uh, they're going to book a coach, uh, they're going to go to some holy place, I don't know, Walsingham, St Albans, York Minster. They're going to go somewhere uh, on the coach, they're going to get out of the coach, they're going to have a service in the holy place, they're going to hit the gift shops, have lunch, get on the coach and come home. And they've been on pilgrimage. Uh, well, to state the obvious, none of our Christian forebears would recognize that as a pilgrimage because the important thing about pilgrimage was making the journey. Uh, it's good to have a destination, but all the things that you're going to learn are going to be learned on the road. It's about traveling rather than arriving. And yet now, as I'll come on to speak about in a minute, we find ourselves in that strange place where we uh, are invited to consider the possibility of going on pilgrimage without actually leaving. Um, how can we inhabit life with the spirit of a pilgrim during these strange days when we're, we've been through lockdown, we can't meet in the way that we want to meet, and we can't do the things we want to do? Having said that, um, I did manage to make one walking pilgrimage during lockdown. Um, I'm now the Archbishop of York, as some of you may know, um, and I'm speaking to you from Bishop Thorpe Palace uh, outside York. And... Uh, as I prepared to make the move from Bishop of Chelmsford to Archbishop of York, I walked to Bradwell, um, which is the, the ancient uh, chapel built by St. Said in 654. Uh, and it was wonderful uh, to, to, to walk there. So what am I sharing with you today? Uh, really, really just two simple things. First of all, that pilgrimage is fundamentally about making a journey. But also I want to offer the invitation that pilgrimage can also be a state of mind. It can be about making interior journeys and about inhabiting life with the spirit of a pilgrim. So, so what is the spirit of a pilgrim? Well, I've spent, uh, you know, I've been on lots of pilgrimages. Um, it, it started when I was a parish priest. Um, I, I went to a parish where there weren't any children or young people in the congregation. I, I really wanted to get some children's work and youth work started. To cut a long story short, the way that I decided to do that was to go on pilgrimage. Uh, I was a vicar in Chichester in the Deep South, and I walked one summer from Chichester to Canterbury, most of which is along the old Canterbury Way, which is now the South Downs Way. And about 10 or a dozen young people came with me. And, and it was a most moving, glorious, quite tough experience. Uh, and over the subsequent years, I, I, I walked to York twice. I walked to Glastonbury. I walked to Walsingham uh, and, yes, to Canterbury. Um, and then a few years ago, when I was given some sabbatical leave by the church, uh, and before I got too decrepit, I walked the great uh, Camino to Santiago de Compostela. I walked the Camino del Norte. Um, joined it at San, uh, Santander, walked about 500 miles to Santiago. 
Um, and it is, of course, the, the great and famous walking pilgrimage. What did I learn on all this walking? Well, well, things that you can carry with you as a pilgrim through life, whether you're actually making a physical journey or not. Uh, the first thing I learned was about traveling light. Um, I, I learned how little you actually need. Uh, when I walked to Santiago, I was quite pleased with myself. I weighed my rucksack on the day before I left and uh, it only weighed just over nine kilograms. And I thought, well, that's good, I'm traveling light. But after a couple of days, I discovered that I had too much stuff um, that you don't actually need nine kilograms of stuff. You can get by with less. And what I can assure you, um, northern Spain is very mountainous. And when you're walking, you know, in, in fairly hot sun, up fairly steep gradients, every ounce counts and you shed it if you possibly can. So to put it a bit crudely, I took with me three pairs of socks, three pairs of knickers, three shirts. And I discovered I didn't need that. Um, you can get by with two, wash one, wear one, wash one, wear one. Um, and, and that's what I did. Um, and, and that was a sobering discovery to discover just how little I, I needed. And of course, when I came home and surveyed all the stuff uh, that I'm surrounded with and, and sometimes burdened down with, you know, so often we can find ourselves ending up being possessed by our possessions. Um, it was good to be on the road and discover how little you actually need. So that was the first thing I learned. I learned how to travel light. I also learned, and I'm not quite sure how best to put this, I learned that there is a space between A and B. Let me try and explain what I mean. Um, most of us, most of the time when we're traveling around, we like to get from A to B in the shortest possible time by the quickest possible route. And we pride ourselves on, on doing that. Uh, but the danger is that we're moving so quickly from A to B, we never notice what is between A and B. And when you walk somewhere or when you inhabit life with the spirit of a pilgrim, you start to notice things. Um, and that was, I think, my first great discovery where, where the, 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 the phrase I used to describe it to myself was, Stephen, at last you've slowed down to God's pace. In fact, I'd put it even stronger than that. I discovered that one of the best ways of being still is to move gently and purposefully. Um, I found I was better able to find an interior stillness, a deep appreciation of what was in front of me and what was around me, and a deep appreciation of this present moment where I am now by walking and by looking and by observing. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a, a wonderful passage in a book by the uh, Canadian author Douglas Copeland where he talks about the joys of, um, of collecting stones and shells and pebbles on the beach, which is something I suppose all of us have done from time to time. And he just says, I'm quoting from memory, he says something like, I love walking along the beach. I love looking out for beautiful stones and shells and pebbles. I love collecting them and putting them in my pocket and taking some of them home. I know you're often not supposed to do that, but we all do. Um, and then he says this, he says, but the more I look, the more I notice that every stone and every shell and every pebble on the beach is beautiful. And so then you get this kind of kind of coming into your mind, this kind of incredible gospel kingdom profligate image of trying to pick up the whole beach and put it in your pocket. Why? Because every stone is beautiful. Every stone is beautiful. Um, and that was one of the gifts I received on pilgrimage. When I slowed down, when I discovered a bit of stillness in my life, when I started actually not focusing on where I was getting to, but focusing on this step I'm taking now, well, I can't think of a better way of putting it. I discovered all the stones are beautiful. I mean, for me, it happened with a camera. You know, I, well, not a camera, I had my phone with me. Um, 
and uh, and northern Spain is beautiful. And I found that every few moments I wanted to get out my phone and take a picture. You know, every turn of the road. I mean, I walked the Camino del Norte. The other reason I walked it is because I thought I won't get lost or to be harder to get lost because the nor- northern northern Camino starts in Irún. If you can if you can put up in your mind a map of Spain. It's you basically go all the way along the northern coast of Spain and then turn left at Galicia down to, to Santiago. So I thought, well, if I keep if I keep the mountains on my left and the sea on my right, I won't be able to get lost. And a lot of the walking is along these beautiful, beautiful mountainous coastal footpaths. And the views are fantastic. Uh, and it, after a couple of days, I said, Stephen, you know, put the wretched phone away. You know, you can't take a photograph of everything. And if you do, all that you're doing is experiencing it all secondhand. Every stone is beautiful. Every view is beautiful. Every blade of grass is beautiful. Just dwell in that moment. Another thing I did as I walked, um, I set myself the happy little task of, um, well, of writing a sonnet each day. It's kind of a mad thing to do, but... I mean, I was walking, you know, you're walking for nine, 10, 11 hours each day. You're on your own in the mountains. You know, there's nothing else to do as you walk. So I thought, well, I'll try and write a sonnet every day. Um, And uh, I I never thought of them. I did it for my own joy, really, as a way of perhaps kind of gathering the things that were happening to me and giving them some expression. And I thought, well, with a sonnet, it's only 14 lines. I can kind of compose it in my head as I walk. And then the, in the evenings, when I stayed at these little pilgrim hostels, I could write, write, write it down. So, um, uh, I mean, they eventually, you know, I can thoroughly recommend it. They've been published um, called Striking Out, which is a deliberate kind of, you know, treble meaning. Um, striking out meaning I'm setting off, but striking out meaning actually I'm putting a bit of a red pen through my life. I, I'm radically simplifying my life to this next step, only taking with me what I need, only observing what's in front of me. Um, And uh, hey, that did my heart good uh, to simplify my life like that. Um, But let me just read you one of the poems. Uh, It's called The Spaces in Between, and it kind of just sums up that different way of inhabiting life, which I experienced on the road and which I long for, and which I promise you I'm gonna come on to say, this might be a way of being a pilgrim without ever actually setting foot at all, because some of us can't, because we just can't, and because of the restrictions we're living under at the moment. Between A and B, there is a vast space. But with eyes on the road and a brisk pace, you'll never see it. It is warm and slow. It finds the contours of the land and goes the same speed as you. If you make your goal the destination, then you'll never know how to travel well. Oh, such misery is heaped upon the world by those who move quickly and think only of the end. Another way is waiting. And all that it requires is what you've already got. Time, candor, and a sturdy pair of shoes. Between A and B, there is a space. It is here and now. It is your life, if you choose. So you won't be surprised to hear, I could say a lot more about the things I learned um, and have learned and carry on learning on pilgrimage. Um, Since walking the Camino four years ago, I then walked the Camino Inglés two years ago. I'm dreaming of walking the Portuguese Camino next year. I walked to Bradwell a couple of months ago. Going on pilgrimage has become a really important part of my life, and I do it for the sheer joy of doing it, but I also do it because I long to inhabit life as a pilgrim. And that's what particularly interests me about where we are 
as we live with COVID-19, as we try to inhabit the world in this way, and as we see the opportunities to live and build a different world that arise from it, seems to me the things that we learn on pilgrimage are so, so important. Is there anything more important for our world to learn at the moment than how to travel light? I mean, actually, it was on, on, on the Camino that I think that, that phrase in the Lord's Prayer that we say every day suddenly became real. Give us today our daily bread. I mean, we all say that, those words, those of us who are Christians, day after day after day. Give us today our daily bread. But do we stop to think what they might mean? And I think what they mean, amongst other things, is give me, Lord, today enough for today and, and save me, stop me, prevent me from wanting more. Uh, and when you travel light, when, when everything you have is, is on your back, uh, when you're dependent upon the hospitality of strangers, where you don't know where you're going to sleep that night, Suddenly, that, Lord, just give me enough for today, uh, suddenly that becomes very real. And as we seek to rebuild the world, um, that's the kind of spirit we need as a human family, as the, as the household of the world. Um, we need to learn how to travel light. We need a much greater appreciation of what is, what is before us. And I also believe um, that as well as inhabiting the world with the spirit of a pilgrim, you can in your imaginations go on pilgrimage without actually leaving. Um, and, and I've been particularly interested in this recently uh, with a book that I read by, by a man called Gavin Wakefield. It's called Saints and Holy Places of Yorkshire. I am the Archbishop of York, so I do need to big up Yorkshire. Um, Saints and Holy Places of Yorkshire, A Pilgrim Guide to God's Own County. Now, I think Gavin wrote the book thinking that when people go on pilgrimage and visit the great holy sites, you know, Whitby, Ripon, places like that, York, uh, in Yorkshire, this is a book that will help them understand and put these places in context. But I read this book during the heart of lockdown, and I tried to read it as it were with the spirit of a pilgrim. And as I read the book and the prayers in the book, I kind of found myself going on pilgrimage in my imagination from my armchair. And there's another similar book, I'm afraid I haven't been able to track down the name of it, I do apologize, but it's by Stephen Need. And it very much is, I think it might even be subtitled, An Armchair Pilgrimage to the Holy Land, but I'm afraid I've probably misrepresented it. But look it up, Stephen Need, a book about the Holy Land. And it's, and it's consciously trying to do the same thing, to say, you can go, you can make this journey in your minds and in your imaginations. So, uh, let me start to draw this to a conclusion. As there's a danger, I will run away with myself, which is precisely what I'm saying we shouldn't be doing. We should take life one step at a time and inhabit life one step at a time. Um, the reason we go on pilgrimage is to learn that we are called to inhabit life as a pilgrim that the whole of life is a journey home to God. Um, and when we make a pilgrimage, be it an actual pilgrimage, which is a glorious thing to do, but don't book the coach, go on foot if you can, or whether, for all sorts of reasons, we can't do that, we make a pilgrimage in our imaginations, it is in order to learn things about how we're supposed to travel through life, of which there are many others I could speak about, but the ones that seem to me to be the most important and most relevant for our world today is about learning what enough looks like, learning how to travel light, um, learning how to appreciate what's in front of us. And perhaps I'd very quickly add to that as well, learning to realize that you can't choose your fellow travelers. Um, again, when you're up in the mountains and you're walking along, if you happen to encounter 
um, a fellow pilgrim who's also walking at about the same pace as you, then they are your companion, whether you like it or not. You could put on blinkers and pretend they're not there, but hey, it's much better uh, to reach out and to love them. That might be a message for the church in particular. Um, in the church, we do like to choose our fellow travellers, um, whereas actually God has lumped us all together, whether we like it or not. So let me uh, finish with another poem. I'm not quite sure which one to read. I chosen a few that I thought might be relevant and helpful but I think I'll finish with with perhaps a sadder one um, this is actually one I wrote when I got home and I couldn't stop dreaming about um, you know even though it's nearly four years ago that I walked that great long Camino it's vividly alive in my head I, I daydream about it far too much and long to be on the road again uh, so this, this is a poem I wrote looking back on the pilgrimage and I suppose almost, almost a prayer that I might be given the grace to hold on to the things I learned, um, that I could live my life as pilgrim. And it was, it's a poem actually written months later uh, th that time of the year where it's still the last of winter, but spring is beginning, beginning to emerge. And it begins by looking into the sky. Today, the sky comes courtesy of Miro. Pallid blocks of light, sharp shards of ice. Imprisoned bulbs still locked in hard earth tight, lift periscopal shoots to chart the light. The lime trees, silent vigil undisturbed, look out upon the passing of the world. And round the ivy weaving weeping willow, all the hopes of spring erupt and flow. At night, the stars resume their long regress, stretching into all too patient darkness. Some things will never happen. This one will, no matter how each sunset scoffs and thrills. All then will rest, enfolded in the sweet, remembered hopefulness all pilgrims keep. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Archbishop Stephen. Um, can I just invite you to cast your mind back a few months to the last time that um, we had a conversation like this? It was very you were Bishop of Chelmsford, and you spoke about pilgrimage with your usual passion and verve, and we could practically see the audience all Googling for kind of walking boots and guidebooks. So my first question is, it has been quite a six months, has it not? And I wonder how it's been for you. Yes, well, I think for, for, for most of us, and particularly for me, I can't pretend it hasn't been a difficult year. Um, I, I'm, I'm a person who likes to be with people. I get my energy from being out and about and being with people and all the things which usually um, fire me and inspire me and sustain me, all of them have been stripped away. But as I began to explore in the talk, which, which bore, as I'm sure you noticed, you know, strong resemblances to the talk I gave at the beginning of the year, there are also differences. Um, and for me particularly, it's been that bit of pilgrimage, which is about having your life stripped back. That um, And there's nothing good about that. I don't want to romanticise that. Um, to have your life stripped back can be extremely painful. Um, and I've been blessed and fortunate that um, even though I have now moved house, um, both the houses I've lived in this year have had, you know, large outdoor spaces. Um, so it hasn't been so bad for me. 
but to have your life stripped back, although painful, is is illuminating. Um, and all the great spiritual writers speak about um, uh, the unmasking of illusion as being one of the first steps in the spiritual journey. Uh, so, yeah, it's been hugely painful. I wish it hadn't happened, but goodness me, the whole world has had its illusions unmasked this yeah. year, me included. Yes, I was very struck by um, your phrase about every stone is beautiful. And I've had, and again, this kind of constricting, um, constrictions we've had on us. I had my own very real experience in the last fortnight. I've been in quarantine because I um, had the cheek to go on holiday and they changed the rules while we were away. And, and like you, very, very lucky having an outside space. Um, and one of the things that it meant for me was that my morning run was no longer around the usual routes. And I found myself running around the garden and feeling slightly embarrassed about that, thinking about the neighbours who were probably hooting with laughter at the sight of this woman going round and round. And so for the first couple of days, I found myself quite cross, really, um, a bit foolish and quite cross to be hemmed in. And then something I noticed, which I can't believe it, how striking it was, I could really smell the apples on the trees and I could really smell the plums in a way that I don't think I would have done um, under any other circumstances. And I think, I don't know, do you think sometimes the narrowing of our horizons just help us to see more clearly sometimes? Yeah, I think it can. It, again, I don't want to over-spiritualise it or romanticise it because it, it does so much depend upon your circumstances but certainly that's been my experience. So uh, we, we always had uh, a little vegetable patch uh, where I used to live in Essex. Um, this year, we probably gave it greater care and attention than it's ever had. And perhaps part of the God's humour on this is, of course, we, we moved just at harvest time. So uh, uh, I don't quite know what's happened to all our vegetables. I did say to the team who work there, please, please help yourselves and pick them. Um, I, I, I came up with a big bag of green tomatoes, which are sitting on my windowsill ripening. Um, but yeah. I, I yeah. grieve for the other things left behind. I quite agree. But God's bounty goes on, does it not? Yeah. Um, now, we've got a couple of questions in. Um, somebody's asking, saying in the Orthodox tradition, the journey is not so much the point. It's much more about um, what we do when we arrive. Um, I just wonder if you've got any reflections on that. Yeah, so I think, is that from Peter Doll? And a, a yes. far be it from me, I, Peter was a colleague of mine um, it, 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 when I was in the Oxford Diocese. Far be it from me to uh, uh, disagree with Peter. Um, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not, not saying he's wrong, but I think clearly there's probably great, there may well be greater emphasis. I simply don't know. There may be greater em emphasis on, on the arrival in the Orthodox tradition. Um, but but ev every pilgrimage requires a journey. So the traveling is always part of it. Um, and certainly I, 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 I'm speaking very personally. For me, it seems that the traveling is, 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 is the important thing. And certainly in the Western tradition, I mean, think of Chaucer, um, it's what happens on the journey, which is, which is really the most interesting. Um, but of course, a journey does need a destination. Um, but uh, but I, I'm firmly committed to those sets of ideas which surround uh, the notion of traveling well and of how we can inhabit life as a pilgrim. And of course, part of the arrival is actually also the fact you've got to come home again, haven't you? And you've referred to your restlessness and how you've sort of dreamed of going back on the road. I think very often, actually, that can be quite difficult, can't it, coming home? You've had this wonderful experience. It's been very enriching. And then you've got to come home and somehow sort of integrate that experience into your life. I, I don't know how yeah. that's for you. Absolutely, Sarah. Um, you know, when I did walk to, to Santiago, the, the, the big walk that I did, as I said, I've, I've been back since on a, doing a smaller, smaller pilgrimage, um, or a small, still 100 miles. Um, uh, um, I just wanted to keep walking. You know, it was great to, great to arrive, but my overwhelming desire was to keep walking. And there was a great sadness that the journey had come to an end. Um, uh, and, and of course, medieval pilgrims, they would have, they would have kept walking because they'd have turned around and walked back. 
Um, you know, I didn't. I got on a plane. Um, and I, I met a man actually over the summer. Um, uh, well, no, it can't have been over the summer. I've just told a lie. It must have been pre-lockdown. I met a man pre-lockdown. It must have been the beginning of the year. Who, who, that's precisely what he did. He he walked from he walked from England to Rome and then turned around and walked back again. Uh, that and that is would have been the way that would yeah. have been the way the medieval pilgrims did it. So in that sense, they had an advantage over us. There was never there was never an end to the journeying. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas yeah. we we you know because we think of holidays, we we put the journey we put the journey into a compartment. So my hope is, and I live it out very poorly. Uh, but my hope is that that um, I might be a pilgrim every day. That I would that those things that I learned on the road and continue to learn might be marks of my my Christian life. Um, and, and, and in that, that way, the journey carries on. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. That somebody Sorry. has asked exactly that question. How do you, particularly in such an incredibly demanding public role? How do you maintain a pilgrimage state of mind? I wonder if yeah. you've got any anything you could share on that in a little bit more detail. Yes, well, of, well, of course, I probably can't. Um, uh, certainly, um, I'm very glad you can just just see see here uh, what's behind me. I'm very glad you can't see where I live because um, I think I could be accused of many things as Archbishop of York. But uh, when it comes to my uh, my house, travelling light is not the phrase that springs to mind. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I think it is it is about those attitudes with which you travel through life, um, uh, the attitudes you have to your possessions, the attitudes you have to food and drink and the things that you need, um, and um, and one of the great spiritual disciplines has always been the the examination of conscience, the examination of life, um, trying. In a, in a healthy and and re retaining your good humor, actually mm. saying, "What do I need in life?" Um, uh, and and it's in those ways. Um, sorry to be able to offer nothing more profound than those ancient Christian dis disciplines of prayer and penitence and self examination. Uh, these these are the things that that make us into pilgrims in daily life. And you, you referred to um, give us our daily bread and that being enough for today and, and how we need that spirit as we rebuild our world. Uh, can you be any more concrete about how, how would you say that when you're speaking to government, for example? How can we get that message across? Yeah, well, I, I think one of the things that Christians should be very concerned about and should be active in is trying to offer the world a different narrative about how we inhabit the world. Um, and again, we don't want to romanticize what's happened this year, but the whole planet heaved a sigh of relief for a, a month or so at the, at the start of the lockdown cars. I mean, as I saw on Twitter yesterday, somebody saying, they'd filled up their car with petrol for the first time in six months. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so using our cars less, you know, planes sitting on runways, uh, the, the planet heaved a sigh of relief. And, and as we now move into, well, we're in a very difficult phase right now, but as we have been in this phase of wanting to get the economy up and running again, um, uh, we, we, we need to be in the forefront um, be the people who are asking the questions. What does a good economy look like? Um, and and if a good economy isn't taking account of the needs of the planet and of the needs of the poor, if we're not asking those questions, then the economy might be up and running and producing um, profit and uh, rising share prices in the short term. But we know. That it will kill us. Uh, so I think Christians need to take every opportunity um, at the local level and at the national level of saying there is a different way of inhabiting the world. Um, and I certainly intend to try to use the new position that I now have to, to tell that story. Um, and I know people will accuse me of being foolish and naive. Um, but, um, well, I think I probably welcome that. I am foolish and naive. Yeah, yes. And um, 
I think one of the things that we've discovered through all of this is just how incredibly interlinked everything is. We're all bound together by these kind of tiny webs so that one decision about not going to the office affects something else or somebody else or transport and so on. And I think maybe that's something we reclaim through pilgrimage is this sense of connectedness. I don't know, does that, does that make sense? That one of the things yeah, it does, but I, I, th I think what I would encourage people to do is to go on pilgrimage um, because um, uh, I think there's things you learn with your head which become much more real when you experience them physically and emotionally through, through the act of making the journey. Um, so I know that's hard at the moment, but it's mm. not impossible. And actually, of course, walking is one of the things you can do. Now, I know, of course, that won't be possible for absolutely everybody. Um, but being outside walking, especially walking on your own or in a group of no less than six, is something that we can do. And uh, introducing a little bit of vulnerability into your life will, will turn out to be a blessing. So the thing I think, you know, there's all sorts of sensible things we could do you know, read a book or write your MP or get involved in other things. And we shouldn't stop doing those things. But I think we might be surprised um, by how we learn the same things in a, in a kind of different way by the act of make, making the journey. And just the little journey. I had a dream at the beginning of the year when, when we met. Um, I had a dream which I hadn't actually spoken to many people about, but I I was going to be... I still haven't been installed in York Minster. That hasn't happened yet. Um, I had this dream that I'd walk from Essex to York and arrive on the morning of the installation and be installed, and I'd arrive on foot. And that in itself, I hoped, would would be a message. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, and instead, I made this relatively little pilgrimage, 30 miles or so, to, to Bradwell, which is the, the great holy place um, in Essex associated with St. Said. Um, the monk from Lindisfarne, uh, and and there there are so many places in in well it, uh, there's people listening I guess from all over the world but I'm thinking of thinking of the UK there are so many places in the UK there's been much work which I'm sure the conference is publicising about pilgrim routes particularly in the north of England mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know I'm, I'm at the moment beginning to plan walking the Sir Cuthbert's way uh, to Durham perhaps later this year or early next year. Yeah. And so I would encourage people to say, let's let's try to learn these things in a different way um, by, uh, by becoming a pilgrim um, and making a journey. And, and I think you, you've touched on something. Pilgrimage has become incredibly popular in recent years, hasn't it? And, and somebody's put something in the chat about um, those BBC programmes. I don't know if you've seen them where they take a group of people... Yeah sort of um, celebrities and I don't know whether you've watched them and enjoyed them or been irritated by them or I you know I think they they provoke a certain reaction in people but uh, why do you think why do you think pilgrimage is so popular at the moment yeah I mean perhaps I need to go back to my dear friend Peter Dole and say I think that's the uh you know that's the other thing about the journey is as as I think I said in the talk um uh, the, the danger now is that the interest in pilgrim is is the is is becoming a kind of ecclesiastical sightseeing. So it's it's interesting go, going to a holy place in a coach. So so I'd strongly encourage people to to actually make a journey on, on foot or on a bike or in, in whatever way they can, but to make the journey that the, the really central bit of the pilgrimage experience. Um, I, I don't really know what why why there's such interest in it. Partly, I guess it's a reaction against um, perhaps a perhaps a reaction against the modern tourist industry, um, which is all about um, which is all about kind of ticking off, seeing seeing things, um, I, I, which I find slightly I've always found slightly grotesque myself. I don't like a city break. Um, and the reason I don't like a city break is not that you can have them much at the moment, but I didn't like a city break because I kind of felt overwhelmed by all the things, you know, this might be the only time I ever go to, I don't know, Florence or wherever. I've got to see this, 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 and this. And you sort of charge around 
um, actually not really often not seeing anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I've become much more interested in learning to love, you know, the blades of grass growing on my patio uh, than I have the El Grecos. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. I want to see both. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, learning that every stone is beautiful requires you to put yourself in a place where you're you're you 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 are simply walking you're at walking pace you're you're not going to get to florence uh, but you are going to get to that corner just there so yeah. learn to love it so th yeah. th they're the blessings and i suppose may maybe those tv programs are reaction against all of that i haven't actually seen them i know exactly what you're talking about i've right. seen the odd clip but I, yeah. I haven't seen them. I think I'd have got too irritated by them. <laughs> I think I think probably my colleague Sally would say the same, that they're quite irritating if, if pilgrimage is something that's very dear to you. Um, now, someone's just put in a, a question in the comments about um, if we end up, if there are more lockdowns and we end up having to walk back over the same ground day after day, and I'm sure some of us had that experience earlier in the year, we were desperate to get out for our daily walk. And actually, you do your couple of circuits and, and there aren't that many variations, depending on where you live. And um, someone's just saying, is there a way in which we can get to know the place for a first time? And how, 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 do, we, how do we make it fresh, I think, is, is, the, is the thinking when we end up walking the same route. So it's not just about going somewhere new. Yeah, I mean, re really, really hard. Um, I, I think it's probably, I mean, I, I've got, I've, I do apologise whoever's asked this question. I'm not sure I've got anything really helpful to say. I mean, I think observing, if you're able to, observing the change of the seasons and appreciating that more is, is clearly something that can be done. But I think maybe learning to look, trying to look much more carefully. I was very, I very moved years ago listening to an interview of David Hockney. And, I mean, David Hockney, um, obviously a great painter, but he, he draws beautifully and um his his drawings are, are, are fabulous and uh this was a sort of tv documentary and uh he was asked about you know his skill as as, as somebody who draws you know how, how did he how did he acquire the the skill they were and they were thinking about obviously the skill with his hands and he replied i can't remember the exact words he used but he said he said all that he said that the the art of being able to draw the skill that you need to acquire is the ability to look he said he said drawing is is not about what you do with your hand first of all it's about what you do with your eyes it's about looking really looking um and and most of us myself included don't look um, our eyes pass over and um and of course the, the modern world of social media and the internet only encourage us. Um, uh, oh, dare I say this? I mean, I I, um, I saw somebody recently who better remain nameless. Uh, not not a, not a fellow bishop, of course, but it was a younger person. They were on a dating. They were they had their phone and they were on a dating, um, you know, dating app, and um, you swipe left or you swipe right, and so these human beings flash up before you and you decide an instant whether you whether you like them or not and um it's terrible uh, it's terrible but of course that is how we look at the world now we're we're endlessly flicking and clicking from one thing to another um and so we're losing if we ever had it we're losing the ability to spend time looking at one thing so that that's the invitation if you're making the same walk each day is is to is to is to look longer and more deeply at, at the things that you have um either that or see if you can vary the walk yes so but, thinking uh, about that, yeah, one other thing very, very quickly so one other thing which occurred to me as well which i don't think i mentioned in the talk is about walking to church you know it, those of us who can still get to church um it did occur to me that your local church is is your local holy place, um, and perhaps if we could think of the local church as place of pilgrimage, um, and and make the going to church part of the experience of being the church, um, and walk to church on Sunday morning, 
Um, and it wouldn't need necessarily take much longer because one thing I've noticed in these COVID days, uh, without without hymns, uh, church services have become shorter. Uh, so uh, you'll still be it'll still be the same amount of time overall if you walk there. And that, in fact, was one of the huge sadnesses when churches were locked um, during the beginning of all this. I know people in in the yeah. village, not churchgoers, but people who were just really sad that they couldn't go to their quiet and beautiful place. And I think that was a real heartbreak, actually, for a lot of people. Um, now, yes, can I? What? Yeah, can I ask about social media? Do you tweet when you're on pilgrimage? Because you're you're very active on Twitter, or do you do you switch off? Uh, when when I when I um, when I walked to Santiago, which was a month of walking, I tweeted as I arrived, and I didn't tweet again until I got there. Mm. And that, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but part of part of what I wanted was solitude and having life stripped back, and so yes. I, I I fasted from social media. <laughs> because there is this thing very often you see when people are um you know travelers or tourists that's different but you know they only know they're there because they've taken a selfie of themselves there which is always yeah weird but yeah um that sort of leads neatly to a couple of questions that have come in that i think are, are related are the sort of difference between going on pilgrimage on your own or going with a group you know what what do you think the differences are and somebody else has said do you feel the pressure to minister to others um who you encounter on the way is it you know do you manage to switch off i might mean, maybe you get recognized i don't know but um do you feel the need do you are you able to sort of is it selfish to say no this is my time uh yes yeah, so certainly the, the 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 walk to santiago the long walk um uh i um I, 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 like, like many clergy i um on when you're on holiday this wasn't holiday well it was it was holy day um uh I I don't lie about what I do, but I don't advertise the fact. And so I'd kind of thought if anybody does ask me what I do, then I will. I, I thought I'll probably tell them I'm a priest rather than say I'm a bishop. Yeah. Um, I mean, I am a priest, so it wasn't actually a lie. But I thought it made life simpler. But the great thing in, sadly, certainly the Camino I walk, I only think I met about three or four English people in the whole month. So, uh, um, so... Um, and not many people walk the Camino del Norte, so uh, I I did meet people, but nobody. nobody I think right in the last week there was a Ro Irish Roman Catholic priest who um, who we had a conversation about church matters, and right. and he spent about an hour moaning about his bishop to me, right. <laughs> um, and I told him I was a priest, and so he yeah. was we were talking as it were priest to priest. And I felt slightly bad that I hadn't told him I was a bishop as well. So that evening in the, you know, I found him in one of the bars and we had a drink and I said, I, perhaps I ought to tell you I'm a bishop as well. I said, but I haven't, you know, I'd rather you kept it to yourself. I've not been advertising the fact. Next day, a couple of people who I'd got to know who, because, you, you know, you, you get to know the people who are walking the same pace as you, uh, came and said, oh, I hear you're a bishop. So I thought, oh, well, thank you, Father, for... Yeah. sharing that with everybody um yeah. the, the the business about solo and group they are very it's a very different experience i've done both i alluded in my talk to mm. i've led a lot of walking pilgrimages with young people to canterbury glastonbury walsingham york um which was wonderful um wonderful thing to do with young people um but uh it's a very different experience when you're walking as part of a group um uh and of course, the conversations you have um, are incredibly rich. There, there's something about conversation yes. when you're side to side with somebody that's very different from when you're face to face. Yes. And then when you add in not just side to side, but space and time, silence is much easier to deal with when you're walking side by side with someone. So I found when I've walked with groups, and of course, when I've walked with groups, I've always been the leader of the pilgrimage, and usually with young people. So I've, I've, you know, been a different sort of relationship. I've found I've had the most profound conversations. Um, it, it's like that thing when you've got teenagers and you're doing the washing up together. You, you can yeah. sort of or, or in the car or whatever, you can have conversations. Yeah. Do you come back from something like that? Do you are you exhausted by the effort of it all, or are you enriched when you have taken? Well, yeah, I mean a bit of both. I mean, I think my personality is one that I get energy from 
from being with people and doing things like that. But I, I really remember when I when I walked to Canterbury with some young people from when I was a parish priest, and we walked from Chichester to Canterbury, which is about 150 miles. It's a and it's, it's really the, the South Downs way, as you probably know, is is the old Pilgrim way. I remember um, back in the parish the following week, and um, this lady, you know, member of the congregation bumped into her into the street and she's I was Father Stephen in those days she said she said oh Father Stephen um, it must be nice to be back in the real world um and and I kind of wanted to scream inside and say to her, this isn't the real world yeah, um, yeah. this is the artificial one um the, the world that I discovered with those young people on the road the conversations I had celebrating the Eucharist by the side of the road you know with a tin cup and a plate and um, sleeping on the floor in church halls. That was real. Um, and the intensity of life and the relationships that were built, which, which I've carried on. Um, you know, there was a young man who who knocked on the vicarage door a few days, well, a week or two before we set off to ask whether he could come on the pilgrimage because a friend of his at school was coming. Never been to church in his life, this lad. And I said to him, well, yes, you, you could come, you know, with, with, with parental permission and filling in the forms. And there was time to do all that. I said, but you will need to follow the rules. And he said, well, what are the rules? Said, well, the rules are we do everything together. You know, you can't go off on your own. We do everything together. And we will be we will be celebrating the Eucharist every day. So I said, you'll have to. I don't expect you to say anything. You know, we don't expect anyone to say the words if you don't believe them. But you can't actually go off and do your own thing because we haven't got enough leaders. So we do everything together. We walk together. We sleep on the floor in church halls together. We pray together. If you can sign up for that, you can come. So he did. Um, and took the, uh, for the first few days. And then somewhere between Chichester and Canterbury, um, looking back, he saw, didn't his heart burn within him as we walked and talked on the road? He, he, he you know, that's how many years ago is that? That was, that was 1989. Um, he, he's now a priest, that, that young man. He, he, he found something on the road. Um, so, yes, walking with a group is, is a wonderful, wonderful thing to do, but it's a very different experience to walking on your own, which is also wonderful. Yeah, yes. So have you got any big plans? I think planning is one of the things that's been so difficult at this time. I have to say, as somebody who kind of runs events as part of you know what I do for a living, I also have two children who have both chosen this moment to get engaged and to try and get married, wow. which has been incredibly difficult. Um, so I think the whole we've all started thinking very differently about planning. But I wondered what your what your plans are. You said you want to do the um, St Cuthbert way. Have you got any other particular um, pilgrimages that you would love to do in when it is possible? Yeah, well, I I I I, I have. You know, it's so hackneyed. I'm embarrassed, but I have I have fallen in love with the Camino, and there's something about there's something about Santiago walking there that really um, makes my heart sing. So I would like to walk the Portuguese Camino. That's the one I want to walk next, and it that might be possible next year. Um, uh, and it, it, I, I'd need to find about a fortnight, and I'd probably do it with Rebecca, my wife. We'd, we'd probably do that one together. Would that um, be the first time for her? No, no. She, she and I walked the Camino in glaze. So we walked right. it, which is, which is, if you want, to, if you want the experience of walking an ancient Camino, that I'd really recommend the Camino in glaze from Ferrol or Corana. It's, it's about 120 kilometers. 120 kilometers. You can do it comfortably if you're reasonably fit. You can do it comfortably in six days. So it fits in nicely into a week's holiday. Um, and so we did that together two years ago, um, and we think we can go a bit further. So we're we're thinking about that, but that was depend on things. But but there's so many wonderful, as I know, there's so many wonderful pilgrimage routes in this country that 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 will definitely be part of our um, holidaying and and resourcing uh, over the coming year. Right. 
Wonderful. I think that's a really good note on which to end. Um, so huge thanks um, for joining us today, Archbishop Stephen. It's been a privilege and a pleasure as always to talk to you. Um, I'll just say to um, those watching that the uh, Festival Bookshop has a free postage today on a list of specially selected titles, which absolutely I'm sure will include you know, several of, um, of Stephen Cottrell's books. Um, and the details will be on screen. You can just follow the links. We're going to take a short break again now. Um, do come back at 12 noon um, when we'll be joined by the Bishop of Norwich, um, uh, Graham Usher. Thank you very much.
I can't see. Oh, well, now I can see myself. Sorry about that. And I was just reflecting on how extremely punctual and efficient all this has been. As an Anglican, I'm used to working either side of the hour, but very rarely actually on it. Anyway, welcome back. I hope you are revived by coffee, tea or the beverage of your choice and ready to hear the Bishop of Norwich, Graham Usher, give his um, interpretation of, of pilgrimage. It's really interesting to see how this subject captures the imaginations of people in such very different ways. Anyway, um, we will hear Bishop Graham speak, and then as, as with the other two, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions using the comment facility, and then join in the, the live discussion after the recorded talk. So over to you, Bishop. Thank you for the invitation to speak at this creative and life-giving festival, even if it feels so different. Lockdown has been a challenging experience for many, many people with its twists and turns of policy and demand. It's been difficult to remember what was originally required of us. But back on the 23rd of March, the Prime Minister addressed the nation saying, that is why people will only be allowed to leave their home for the following very limited reasons. Shopping for basic necessities, one form of exercise a day, for example, a run, a walk, cycle, any medical need to provide care, or traveling to and from work, but only when absolutely necessary. That's all, he said. These are the only reasons you should leave your home. People really appreciated their daily exercise. For me, it wasn't too much of a hardship. I love to get out walking and I've come to realize that walking is very much a part of my own spiritual life. I heard some people speaking about how they were noticing the arrival of spring. They'd never really seen it before. How they heard birdsong more. And there were various online videos of wildlife entering our towns and cities, goats in Bandudno, kangaroos in Sydney, dolphins in Venice, and I even saw a video of the Loch Ness Monster wandering around in Inverness. So walking is one of those simple things that we do as humans. It's the way most of us experience life. As the oldest mode of transport, our ancestors crossed the earth on foot and walked themselves into being. For most people, walking has passed from the realm of daily necessity to that of leisure and choice. Though, of course, for many, many millions of people around the world, it's not a choice. They simply have to walk to collect firewood or water every day. But it does bring pleasure, joy, happiness, serenity. And I find that walking refreshes me as well as slowing me down. That gentle movement relaxes my body while the rhythm gives me time to think. So that those complex thoughts and worries that whirl around my head become somewhat clearer. Only last week, the day before my son was off, on to the next stage of his life, I noticed we were both being a bit tetchy one with another. And I suggested a walk that was roundly denied. But then later we did go off for a walk and uh, we spoke to the dogs for the first mile. But by the third and the fourth, we were speaking to each other and having a great conversation. Thanks for that, Dad, as we got home. And I think walking helps with good conversations. I think it also helps with difficult conversations or where there's a great nervousness. In ministry, I found that walking with people literally and metaphorically can be really advantageous. Who knows, perhaps a third person is joining us and opening our minds to see things a little differently. Salvatore Ambulando said at St. Augustine, or 
perhaps it was St. Jerome, there's a bit of a dispute about that. It is solved by walking. So when I'm in a stew, when work and life are getting too much for me, when I'm not thinking clearly or just feeling very, very fuzzy headed, when I'm exhausted or fearful or feeling low, I walk and I walk and I walk. And I find a resonance in the Scottish poet Thomas A. Clarke's words, there are walks on which I lose myself, walks which return me to myself again. In that rhythm of foot before foot, solo or in the company of others, I find that work and life, thought and mind become increasingly harmonious. I find myself walking, in a sense, into the depths of my own humanity. And walking helps me to pray, and leads me to encounter God. It's as if I have a companion at my side or up in front leading me on at times or whispering from behind, encouraging me to take the step I dare not to take, but perhaps need to. Perhaps it's the rhythm, the rhythm of things as I see things around me that sparks the things to pray for and the chain of connections that that results in. Or the rhythm leads to a meditative kind of prayer as I fit the words of the Jesus prayer to my stride or my stride becomes the Jesus prayer. Walking can lead me to feeling more fully alive. It can also stir up. I need to be alert to the anger and frustrations and insecurities and those demon-sized ghosts of the imagination that can build as I move from walking to kind of stomping the ground underfoot at times. And I guess my starting point to reflect on walking and pilgrimage is to see the pattern of Jesus's life. He walked a lot. Even before he was born, Mary carried him as she climbed up to the hill country where her cousin Elizabeth lived. A decade or more later, Mary and Joseph returning from Jerusalem thought that their son was ahead as part of the walking caravan of pilgrims, not knowing that he had stayed behind in the temple. And during the rest of his life in and around Nazareth as a itinerant carpenter and rabbi on pilgrimages to Jerusalem, or for an intensive period of three or so years, Jesus walked the highways and the byways of the Galilee, and even on the sea itself. He encouraged his disciples to walk with him. He taught them, he healed the sick by the side of the road, and those who were unable to walk began to walk. He kept doing things and encountering people, as the Gospels put it, as he was going or as he walked. And he told his disciples that when they were not welcomed by a community, they should shake the dust off their feet and walk on. His emphasis, of course, was always on noticing people who hadn't been noticed. He walked towards people, inviting them to discover life in all its abundance, saying, come, follow me. And so I wonder, what are the conversations we have along the way on our pilgrimages? How, I wonder, might they shape us, be gifts to us, change the very pattern of our day? The theologian Dan Hardy summed this up by describing Jesus walking step by step through the land. And after every set of steps, he met someone, stood by someone, one-to-one. -one, and in some way, he touched and healed each one. Jesus was also deeply connected to the land he walked and the soil beneath his feet. He observed the plants that withered under the scorching sun, the lilies, the choking thistles, the size of the mustard bushes, the lack of fruit on a fig tree, and the grain in the fields ready to be winnowed in the hand and eaten on a Sabbath day's journey. He listened to those he walked with, picked up 
the nuance of their conversation, spotted the trick question and challenged the conceit of those who wanted greatness and honor. As one pilgrim along the Camino reflected, the road was where Jesus was to be found. It was his classroom, his podium, his laboratory, and his sanctuary. So I wonder if that is part of the joy of pilgrimage for us, noticing, paying attention to self and to others, to landscape and buildings, to the small things and to the wide skies and the clouds, the very landscape, absorbing it all, embracing it, whilst also allowing time to be lost in it. And at times the gospel writers talk about how Jesus takes himself off to be lost in the landscape, off to be lonely to deserted places to pray, often up a mountain echoing Moses' ascent to speak with God. It's in these walks that he recharged himself and found intimacy with God the Father amidst the whole of creation. And in my mind's eye, I see, see him gulping the air as he climbs higher up the hillside, sweat on his brow, arms flung wide in joy as he senses a freedom from the eyes of the crowd always fixed upon him. And that outpouring of praise and prayer from his lips. For our filled lives and our overfilled demands, where might a daily pilgrimage take us to a place of freedom so as to simply be, to be simply? Where are the places where we can encounter the silence of prayer and the prayer of silence? Yet, of course, soon Jesus was to set his face to go to Jerusalem, to walk to the cross, to death and to resurrection. And on the night that he was handed over, Jesus took a towel and wrapped it around his waist. He knelt down and took the sweaty, dirty, calloused feet of each of his disciples in turn. Water was poured, feet were cleaned of the mud of the road and whatever else had been stood in. Of course, the city was filled with Passover pilgrims and Passover lambs. Then those feet were carefully dried perhaps even tenderly touched. As a woman had massaged Jesus' own feet using a jar of costly ointment. In this simple practicing of a lowly job, usually reserved for a slave in the household, Jesus showed the disciples that no one is above serving others, not even the Messiah. I wonder what our church might be like if he had said that night do this in remembrance of me the disciples feet are as precious as the minds he will illuminate the hands that jesus will hold the mouths that he will feed and the hearts that he will warm here the word made flesh stoop to take the grubby, smelly stuff of the world, the bruised flesh, and to show how and why the word is with us. God humbly walking with us, willing to be earthed in the stuff of the world. And following his trial, while disciples fled in fear and Peter disowned him, Jesus was led out on an exhausting, solitary walk through the teeming streets of Jerusalem. And very soon he needed someone to help him carry the cross on that last stumbling trudge. And on that green hill far away outside the city wall, he was nailed down, pinned to wood, so that he was unable to walk any longer. And yet, in the resurrection appearances, two Marys clung to the risen Jesus' feet. He showed his disciples not only his hands, but also his pierced feet. And he joined two of his followers on a mournful walk to Emmaus. A Japanese theologian 
Kusuki Koyama spoke of how God walks slowly because he's love. He wrote this, if he's not love, he would have gone much faster. Love has its speed. It's an inner speed. It's a spiritual speed. It's a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we are accustomed. It is slow, yet it is our Lord over all other speeds, since it is the speed of love. It goes on in the depths of our lives, whether we notice it or not, at three miles an hour. It's the speed we walk, and therefore it's the speed the love of God walks. Deep within his Jewish identity was this sense for Jesus that he belonged to a people who followed Yahweh, God of the way, a pilgrim people. God's sanctuary was the mobile ark, his house a movable tent, his altar a cairn of rough stones that could be erected and dismantled, and he led his people wandering on that nomadic journey for 40 years in the harsh environment of the desert, a crucible which formed and shaped them as a nation with a history, a story and a memory, a pilgrim people always remembering their physical walk, walking with the Lord sometimes near and yet sometimes also far off. So when we are on a pilgrimage, what might be the advice we take with us? Travel light has often been the advice that I've been given. I plan carefully seeking to carry the minimal amount, even to make sure I have a near finished tube of toothpaste. And yet once home, I unpack my rucksack and check which things I really didn't need. The things I carried just in case, and there's always plenty of them. Jesus, who had nowhere to lay his head, urged his disciples to dispense with home and luxuries, taking nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. There's a riskiness to that, to all pilgrimage. It opens us to our own vulnerabilities. Travelling light on a pilgrimage emphasises our frailty and our need. As we declutter our life, if we move from our securities, even just for a few days. And as I decide what to take and what not to take, I find that something's going on internally, the, the laying down of particular things, the relinquishing of certain responsibilities, even if temporarily, a letting go of old securities that I tend to hang on to too much. Among the first pilgrims to set out in search of Jesus were the Magi. And of course, they came for their own particular reasons. In W.H. Auden's wonderful poem, For the Time Being, he imagines what those reasons might be. The first who Auden imagined to be a scientist said that he had traveled to discover how to be truthful now is the reason I follow the star. The second for Auden was steeped in philosophy. He came with a thankfulness to discover how to be living now. The third gift bearer for Auden was a sociologist who, having searched high and low, hadn't been able to find a just and fair society and concluded that his pilgrimage is to discover how to be loving now. And in the manger of Bethlehem, Auden's Magi discover what it is to live truthfully, to live thankfully, to live loving God and neighbor. And in unison, he has them say, to discover how to be human now is the reason to follow the star. For at the heart of pilgrimage is this question of what are we encountering? What are we discovering in this time to breathe, to reflect, reflect on where we are, who we are, and where we're going? What are we encountering? What are we discovering? For in this experience that integrates body and soul, feet and faith, 
We seek and long to find, we knock and hope that the door will be opened to us. Pilgrimage is not an escape from life. It is for me and I know for countless others, a journey that goes deeper into life. And as was said in medieval times, for those who go on pilgrimage, if you don't travel with the king whom you seek, you will not find him at the end of your journey. When we're entering into a time of pilgrimage, we need to remind ourselves that God is with us as we walk, rather than just at the destination that we seek. Being prepared to meet God in the sweat and the dust along the way is vital. The secularity of the ordinary needs to mix with the sacredness of the holy. And I guess a clue to that is in the word pilgrim with its derivation from the Latin word for strange or foreigner, peregrinus, made up of per, meaning through, and ego, meaning field or land. A pilgrim is therefore someone who leaves the comfort of their own home and hearth to travel beyond familiar boundaries, to cross through fields into new landscapes, to encounter the unknown with all its attendant risks and dangers, opportunities and surprises. So as such, we can look an odd bunch, inhabitants of another land wearing different clothes or speaking in a different accent or dialect or language, we become strangers potentially in the land. The land can be a stranger to us. We move into this liminal space, not quite part of where we are traveling through. And on a pilgrimage journey in search of a saint, there can be a surprising sense of presence as we walk. Perhaps even the long dead spiritual women and men we may seem to be looking out for are very much alive, willing to help us on our journey. We might even discover aspects of those saints' lives in the lives of those who journey with us or we encounter on the way the gentle touch, the smile of encouragement, the sharing of food, the frustrated, harsh word, the smile, that means everything. The evangelist zeal, the exhausted legs that have walked for miles, or the beauty of a life we come across that is so focused on God. As we set off, we never know who we'll share the journey with, some will not be those we might have ordinarily have chosen to follow in the way with. But might they be gifts to us on that journey? And of course, pilgrims go in search not only of others, but perhaps a story from the past. And in so doing, trace their own story through the landscape. We may have heard reports of what was happened what has happened in a particular place and want to see for ourselves, to smell the air or taste its spirit, to breathe where holy men and women have breathed, to be up close where miracles have been witnessed or are still witnessed or we hope will be witnessed in the future. Such places we approach with a certain hunger, whether to offer respect or to give thanks, to commemorate or to pay homage, to be healed or to seek forgiveness, to find something deeply precious that's been lost or has been elusive for a time. I'm reminded of St. Augustine's well-known words, you made us for yourself and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. And so it's good to ask ourselves, what am I doing here? What does this place mean and how does it speak to me of God and then we return home to integrate the story of that journey into our own lives for we often discover a remarkable depth of prayer along the way or 
at holy places or the tombs of saints. Our body can be filled with it from head to toe. But it's not just about the destination. As I've hinted at, getting home is as important as getting there. The journey out is the foundation, and on the journey back, when we've been influenced by our experiences, we see the route in a different way, from a different direction. Whatever the journey we've made, our lives will be changed. Our metaphorical pollen is worked into honey. And we're called to continue that long tradition of being a pilgrim people. I'm always so deeply moved that Jesus entrusted a small community, a tiny, fragile community with his message. And those disciples, the early apostles, would change the world with that message. As the message gained legs, as other people encountered what God has done for us in the life and death and resurrection and ascension of his son, Jesus Christ. And within just a few short years of his death, the words of Jesus would be walked to the ends of the known world. And as people were baptized, so the wet footprints of the totally immersed could be seen going in every direction, setting out on a lifetime of pilgrimage. So may your mini pilgrimages and may your lifelong walk with the Lord be for you as much as it's shaping out for me a joyous adventure. Thank you very much. And um, I think one of the, we've now heard three talks, very different talks about pilgrimage, but there are some really um, strong, rich themes coming through now. Um, things about traveling light and how that, this might uh, work back into our everyday lives. Something about a willingness to take risks, to step out bravely. Something about encounter, whether it is encountering ourselves, encountering those uh, with whom we make the journey or those whom we meet on the journey, but also very, um, and you might have expected this, a very strong resonance with the uh, Road to Emmaus story, with encountering Christ, with encountering God. And one of the reasons um, Sarah and I, when we first started thinking about this festival of pilgrimage, we were very certain that we wanted to include the word Christian because we wanted an acknowledgement that this is Christian pilgrimage and that it is about an encounter being open to encounter to God. And that has come through very strongly. There's also something about, um, I think, timing and speed and walking more slowly and being more aware of the landscape around us. And um, I know you, Bishop, have a uh, very a, a real heart for the environment, for, in, for ecology. Do you just want to say a bit more about how pilgrimage can inform an increased awareness of, of the environment? I know when I was, when we were in lockdown, my, one of my churches is two miles from the other. And I made that walk every day. And, and as I did it day after day, I could really see the landscape as we moved from spring into summer, the landscape change and come alive. And it was an incredibly profound experience, one I would not have otherwise had because I would have gone somewhere else. Um, but as I say, do you want to just kind of expand a bit on, on pilgrimage and environment, ecology? Uh, Sally, thank you very much. And uh, what a joy it's been to be part of this amazing uh, festival that you've been so creative in putting together in this new way. Well, I think you're right. Lots of people were reflecting on how uh, during lockdown they they saw uh, the 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 spring unfold, hearing birdsong, as I think I said in my talk. And you know, there is that sense of um, 
and I think the Archbishop of York alluded to this, of, of seeing more clearly because we're simply walking and uh, going more slowly. There, there is the sense you can stop and start. You can uh, take a, a close look at something that you, you just see in the corner of your eye um, and have a greater sense of appreciation. I'm, I'm very conscious uh, John Ruskin was really the, 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 the person who um, saw so attentively. And of course, it's, it's the skill of so many artists in that I, I think in learning to draw is, is about um, learning to really see the detail and be attentive. So when you are attentive to the natural world, when you, you, you take in things where you see the, the rhythm of the seasons of, of how um, birds are building their nests, you see the clues in the landscape to all sorts of uh, natural things that are going on and the, and the clues in the landscape perhaps to the to the history of of of, of that area of of the field systems of hedgerows of, of of our inner cities and how they've been created and and made within the landscape then i think there's a sense of our our human responses well how can we protect the wonderful things that we see how can we uh, enhance where we come across litter and uh, and other aspects that are that are not good for the environment, where you know that you see people um, and very gladly picking things picking things up as they as they go along. So I think there is a sense of of our human response to the natural world um, needs to um, and can respond so that we learn to tread more gently on the earth. It, it fills us with a sense of ultimately a sense of awe and wonder, and I think. Uh, awe and wonder are integral to how we, um, in the future and of today, create a, a better environment for biodiversity and, and for our planet. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, one of the, a theme that I think kind of ties in with that and was mentioned, uh, particularly discussed by Sarah and Stephen, was the whole idea of the, the lockdown having forced us really to focus more on the local. So instead of seeing wider in in some respects we were actually bringing our attention down to our near neighborhood and some of the questions and comments that are coming through are about how to bring the pilgrimage theme alive if you like to our local communities and, and local congregations do you just want to say a bit about that and with particular reference i know norwich has, has got a, the diocese has got a real heart for pilgrimage and there are lots of really good um, pilgrimage initiatives going on in your diocese. Do you, would you just like to expand on that? Well, here it's really been led so brilliantly by Peter Doll, uh, mm -hmm. one of the residential canons at the cathedral who ha has has done remarkable work and with a group of other people has led on creating a pilgrimage route from Norwich Cathedral and, and from the Shrine of, 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 of Julian uh, to um, the Shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham. And uh, uh, it's a, a great route. I walked it earlier in the summer um, as a, a, a prayer over three days for an end to this pandemic and praying uh, for the people from this diocese who've, who've died from COVID. And I was joined on that route with other people as I, I went along. And that was a, that was a great uh, joy to, to, to witness that. And, and there is a sense here of, of enjoying um, and taking part in pilgrimages, which of course links so much to the history of of both of, of those places. Of course, Marjorie Kemp came uh, to mm. visit Mother Julian at, at um, in her anchorage um, here in, in Norwich, a long tradition of visiting holy people and holy holy places. So I'm, I'm just sort of keen to uh, encourage that, encourage um, not only the historic pilgrim routes, but also to encourage a sense of pilgrimage in people's daily life. So perhaps having a prayer walk around your, your neighborhood, um, praying for, for situations and, and, and sites using the kind of raw material of your walk, of signage and notices and posters or things you observe to draw into a, a, a prayer um, a, as part of a, a daily walk. Also within the liturgy of the church, we mustn't forget that so many of our liturgies are, are ultimately about um, being a pilgrim people. Um, as we as we move through a church building from from font to altar, uh, as we live out, reenact a journey um, at significant points in the, the the seasonal liturgical year of um, 
you know, Ash Wednesday or um, the events of Holy Week, of, of Pentecost, all of these, the Advent procession uh, can, can all be part of a sense of being a pilgrim people of God. Thank you, yes. And um, we're hoping that our, our website, which, we, which we'll be, I don't know, plugging, unveiling something later on this afternoon, will also be a forum where people can post resources and, and use resources for themselves, to, which will help local churches and local communities engage more in pilgrimage. So we're hoping it will be kind of a resource hub so that all the good ideas that, that some people are having can be used and adapted and used creatively in other areas. And I think we will also be talking a bit more about how it's, uh, for those of us who can't necessarily walk all the way to Santiago de Compostela, how we can bring in um, a pilgrimage spirituality to our everyday lives, which I know is is something that 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 you have been have been working on, and which every speaker actually has kind of reinforced the whole the pilgrim spirit. Do, will you are you prepared to to say a bit about how you engage with pilgrimage spirituality in your in your daily life? Well, I think I think it's for me it's it's knowing that I'm on a lifelong journey as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. I, I've, I've, the joy of this journey is I, I never arrive. I will arrive, God willing, I hope, on the day of my death. And uh, part of the joy of, of, of this journey is this continued for me unfolding of, of dwelling under scripture, of uh, dwelling in this presence of the spirit to be led on a journey that is always enlightening. And I, I draw from that the insights of um, the holy mothers and fathers of the church of the past, of, of contemporary pilgrims on the way who I always have learnt hugely uh, from. Uh, and I'm, I'm conscious that that's um, any talk of pilgrimage in terms of physical movement. I, I worry deeply that that could also be excluding that there are those who uh, aren't able to leave their armchairs um, who aren't able to leave their homes for various uh, reasons who aren't able to walk um, I'm very conscious when I was a parish priest in Northumberland probably the most holiest of parishioners that I had was sort of an amazing woman who never left her her armchair in the last stages of her life she uh, even slept in it and yet she was one of the holiest people I've come across and was devoted to prayer, a prayer of intercession for the life of the parish, and very much spoke of being a pilgrim uh, on the way. And you, we mentioned, I think, in an earlier session with, with uh, Archbishop Stephen, um, you, he was asked whether he tweeted on the, on the way, and I, I don't tend to, but I did um, on a, the pilgrimage I made to Walsingham from Norwich uh, back in July. And, and it had the very surprising consequence that a number of people, uh, they joined me on pilgrimage, but from their own homes. And mm -hmm. they were shielding or whatever reason they couldn't leave their own home. And they were actually taking part in that journey. So, and I had never realized that that would be something that would be a consequence of, of tweeting a few tweets each day along that journey, a few reflections uh, to support people. I, th I thought I was just sharing something, but actually it was a deeper spiritual uh, moment for, for those who, some of those who were following. Yes, and I um, in our deanery, um, a very keen pilgrim during lockdown couldn't do the pilgrimage, pilgrim paths that we had set up. So instead, um, put up the, the, the route description and photographs of the route so people could follow it from, from their armchairs and their imagination. Which kind of brings me on um, a comment you made at, at the beginning of your talk about um, some people, there are people who, who want to walk, there are people who want to walk but are unable to. But you also said some people walk because they have to. Do you want to just open that statement out a bit? Well, I, I think... For, for some, perhaps even for myself, that uh, 
spirituality may be very connected uh, with with a sense of of walking. And I, I guess what I was trying to say there was that um, for for some, uh, their prayer is enhanced by the sense of going towards a very physical destination, perhaps in the company of uh, or searching out for uh, somebody who had a significant life in that place or a particular uh, life of holiness or where a particular event has, has happened. And that can draw them um, into a deeper sense of relationship with, with God. You mentioned um, the Emmaus Road story uh, earlier, and I, I keep being drawn back to that story within uh, reflections of, of pilgrimage. It just is so rich in, in its textures. And uh, of course, we mustn't forget that those disciples, as, as they had left Jerusalem, were, were mournful, were despondent. Um, uh, I'm no Greek scholar, but they, I understand that the, the, the Greek words change for what they, uh, first of all, talking with each other and then uh, d arguing with each other. And then literally, uh, it says that they're literally sort of kind of throwing words at each other. It, it became a really heated argument. And yet within that space, as they, they moved away from Jerusalem, perhaps in search of their former lives, perhaps uh, we just don't know. We don't know who they, they were. We just know the name of, uh, of one of them. Uh, but into that comes Jesus and not recognized at first, but at a pause in the journey uh, as they stop and as bread is broken, they, they recognize him in their midst. So I think for some people, um, seeing our Christian journey, uh, both week by week, but but also longitudinally through our lives, as uh, something of that pilgrim journey where we stop from time to time and recognize that Christ has been with us uh, along the journey is important. Um, and picking up on a comment that's just come up, you, you talk about on the road to Emmaus, they were walking away from Jerusalem and somebody said there are lots of lovely images of hedgerows and birdsong, any thoughts of pilgrimage in an urban environment? Now, I'm, I'm in rural ministry, have spent most of my time in rural ministry, so my response is kind of, well, get out of the city and come and visit us out in the sticks. But um, I expect you can say something more constructive about pilgrimage in an urban environment. Well, I'm not, I'm not very sure if I can, <laughs> other than uh, drawing on my own experience of, of um, living here in the centre of Norwich and each day of lockdown, I tried to get out for my half, half an hour of, of walking to a different part of the city. And I learned a lot about the city just by simply walking, generally early in the morning, um, around observing signs and, and seeing, seeing you know, what was, what was around. And, uh, and Mother Julian Shrine was about 15 minutes walk from here, so I could get there and back in, in half an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and as a parish priest in the centre of Middlesbrough years ago, we had parish prayer pilgrimages around the parish, a very densely populated area of Victorian back-to-backs, and then lots of area where houses had been um, demolished and taken away and, and a small group of people praying as they walked, um, as we walked around the parish praying for people who lived in different streets and, and the situations and the context of that place. I imagine it's also, and, and others will be able to speak much better than me about this, but it's about noticing the little moments of gracious gift the, in, in every context that we're in. What, what's the sacrament of the present moment uh, in this place that I'm in at the moment? And it's, it's worth it's noticing, noticing also um, the, the long distance pilgrim routes that I have walked, which often end up in a big city, for example, Santiago de Compostela. You have to go through an awful lot of suburban, urban, and sometimes industrialized landscape. So the, there is a, a kind of a balance between the rural and and the urban um but, but it's with the rural, sorry and it's not to rush through um the 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 industrial and the 
wasteland and uh, and the areas to try and get to the rural because that's somehow better or prettier or nicer to be in it. It's I, I want to ask the question: What's God's gift to us here in this place that we are now? If you mm. walk from um, uh, from London to Canterbury, you you pass by all the the kind of backside of London, all the all the junkyards that where the sewerage happens is sorted, you know, where all the rubbish of London gets sorted as you go out uh, towards the Dartmouth uh, Bridge. And that 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 is not an incredibly attractive area at all, but it becomes part of the letting go and the taking up of a pilgrimage from London to Canterbury, part of the raw material of what one might be uh, thinking of. Uh, as you you set off on that pilgrimage journey, and I'm valuing it all for its all its differences, mm. or or um, lamenting it as well. And we we started this conversation about the environment, and actually, when you see some of these landscapes where uh, things are despoiled, um, well, some are, are about recycling and and um, reusing. But there's a lament to what we've done in terms of damage to um, much of our landscape as well. And and following a, slightly on that theme, you um, you said that the road is where Jesus is to be found. I'm just looking across at my notes here, his classroom and his sanctuary. And of course, what struck me instantly was was what does that then say about churches particularly small ones, of which you have 656, and um, th their significance, because I think particularly for rural ministers at this time, there's a real concern about small, holy places and what might be their future. Well, I think we've got to um, recognise that our, every church is a treasure trove of memory of a local community, uh, should be a precious uh, a holy place set aside, a place that's treasured by that locality and that that community. Um, what I'm interested in Norfolk is I come across a large number of, uh, uh, beyond our 656 churches, a large number of medieval churches that are now ruins, which is very, very interesting. In the middle of fields, I come across them and, and, I, and I ask myself, what's the story here? What, what where where is God to be found here? Where has God been found here? What's the story why this place um, is no longer a place where Christians gather to praise uh, God amongst us? And so I think there's some there's some big questions there about um, the su survival, the the resourcing, the the flourishing of the rural church. But let's not forget they're a bit like. Um, cairns uh, on a mountainside they can so often uh, lead the way be a place of where 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 there are places of invitation of welcome and it's it's been remarkable here in norfolk to see how many of our churches have very quickly reopened um for people to just simply go and be to be still and silent uh, to encounter uh so let's let's celebrate them and not see them as great millstones, as some may wish to see, but uh, celebrate them as, I hope and pray, living places of the living God who can be encountered each and every day along a journey. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, just coming to the end now, I have, <laughs> somebody has said, um, whether has asked whether prayer walks are class, can be classed as acts of worship. That's really a question for your archdeacon. I haven't got a clue. Um, as, long as, as long as less than six, I think. <laughs> yes, fewer than six. I uh, don't know. Um, you also mentioned, just one last thing, you asked the question, what would the church look like if foot washing had become the sacrament? Foot washing was what was done in remembrance of me. For you, what would your church look like if foot washing had become a sacramental act? I would hope it would have been would be a humbler, um, simpler church that stoops down to be with the lost, the least, and the lonely. 
I would hope that in that act, and I, I find that on Monday, Thursday, uh, each year, and as a bishop, I've been very privileged to um, sometimes be in prisons on Monday, Thursday, and wash the feet of prisoners, and it's moved me to tears each time, as it did as a parish priest of of washing um, parishioners' feet, and sometimes. Um, parishioners who I rejoiced in and, and sometimes parishioners who I found mighty difficult to live together with in, in, a, in a community uh, following Jesus, but always profoundly moved me. And I would hope that in that very act where you physically need to stoop down lower, where you, you take very simple things of a water, of, of ref, the refreshment of a, a, a towel and and you touch the bits of our bodies that we think are ugly we think um, we hide away under socks and shoes and uh, don't like to show I, I i was very moved when i stayed with the bedouin um, a couple of years ago in the judean desert and was out um spent a day out with the herdsmen in in the desert moving very slowly, really, with a flock of sheep and goats uh, from place to place as they looked for, for vegetation for the, for the animals. And on the, in the evening, we came back to the black tents and uh, sat at the entrance of the tent and water was brought and uh, feet were washed before we then dipped bread into a common uh, big open pot uh, of stew for our evening meal. So humbler, simpler. I just wonder what that would say um, to, to the world mm -hmm. about our ministry of, of, of service, of, of genuinely wanting to be alongside uh, and with people. It, it might then influence so many other ways that we want to be or feel called to be our call to be church. Thank you. What, what a wonderful note on which to pause for lunch. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Sir. We are, sorry, uh, just we are returning at two. We're returning at two o'clock. Go off, eat lunch, go wild, reflect about pilgrimage, and we'll see you again after at lunchtime. After lunch.
Welcome back, everybody. It's really good to see you, and I hope you've had uh, a refreshing uh, break and some uh, lunch and a chance to reflect on all you've heard this morning. It's uh, my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you uh, the Reverend Dr. D. Dias, who is reader in the history of Christianity and director of the Centre for the Study of Christianity and Culture and the Centre for Pilgrimage Studies at the University of York. And her research interests and publications, which are many, have focused primarily on the history, the experience, and the significance of pilgrimage from the earliest centuries to the present day, and the interaction between Christian belief and practice with Western culture, particularly in uh, relation to literature and art. I've known Dee for a number of years and uh, have long admired her uh, fabulous work on pilgrimage. So it's a great pleasure to have her here with us this afternoon to talk to us. And then there will be an opportunity, as usual, to ask questions over the chat, which Dee will be glad to address. Dee, over to you. Thank you and welcome. Hello, I'm Dee Dias from the Centre for the Study of Christianity at the University of York. I'm also director of the Centre for Pilgrimage Studies which may be why I was asked to speak about theology ambushed by experience and whether this is an appropriate way of looking at pilgrimage today. I'd like to start by using some words from Alice Through the Looking Glass, written by Charles Dodgson, aka Lewis Carroll, a man who spent much of his life at Christchurch, the virtual home for this conference. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. And Alice's rather blunt challenge ought to make those of us who think about, talk about and practice pilgrimage sit up and take notice, especially when thinking about pilgrimage in a Christian context. Because today, pilgrimage is definitely one of those words that can mean a multitude of things. A few days ago, I did a search in the US Library of Congress catalog and came up with 4,704 titles containing the word pilgrimage. These include an Australian wine pilgrimage, a bowling pilgrimage, a patchwork pilgrimage, that's about quilting in case you were wondering, a pilgrimage by foot and greyhound bus to Tolkien's Middle Earth, and even a flying saucer pilgrimage. These wildly varying uses of the word show its great flexibility. They also show that very flexibility means that anyone who has a fancy to do so can adopt it and Humpty Dumpty like make it mean whatever they want. Just using the word today is enough to invest almost any kind of journey with significance. Does it matter? Well, no and yes, no in that the intuitive understanding by people in general that pilgrimage is somehow means a special journey to a special place with a special meaning is, a con is undoubtedly very important. Journeying to special places is a concept and practice familiar to those of almost every religion and meaningful to many who don't subscribe to any form of religious system. It's therefore a great unifier and almost uniquely a religious term that doesn't frighten people. That's one reason why churches, especially cathedrals, have been using it a great deal over the last few years to draw in visitors. However, the flip side is the pilgrimage is now used so widely that sometimes it's hard to know what it actually means. This isn't helped by the fact that pilgrimage has had a rather checkered past in Christian thinking and experience. With many ways of interpreting its meaning, even within this one faith, and there have been huge challenges in holding together its practical manifestations. For pilgrimage within Christianity is not a single concept, but a mosaic of ideas and experiences that have evolved through the centuries. Sometimes these have combined really well, reasonably well, sometimes they've conflicted. One of the biggest confrontations was at the Reformation, but this was by no means the first or the last chapter in this story. As a result, there are many kinds of pilgrims, many kinds of pilgrimage, each with something particular to offer. Some emphasize the benefits of the journey. Some 
with an emphasis on fellowship, being with people, the space that it offers to rebuild and refocus on what's important to us. And I think the effect of, as this last quote says here, the effect of the way that pilgrimage changes people and makes them more open, more able to engage with life in general. Some also focus on the joys of arrival, while others feel the only way to progress spiritually is to stay still physically. But at the heart of all of these ways of being a pilgrim, of doing pilgrimage, is the fact they're centered on learning about God, meeting him and being changed by him. Pilgrimage, whichever way we look at it in a Christian context, is about revelation, encounter with God and transformation. So the question for us today is how can we understand the range of riches available to us, maximize their potential and share them with others? Let me give you some snapshots through time of people and places that show what I mean. Let's start with the surprisingly wide range of pilgrim experience in the Bible. If we look at the Bible through a pilgrim lens, we find widely different models framing experience of God in contrasting ways. In the Old Testament, I'm calling it that rather than Hebrew Bible because we're talking here about Christian interpretation, we see two main approaches to pilgrim engagement with God, journeying with him and journeying to him. I must uh, confess here that as having trained as a medievalist, I do have a tendency to use quite a lot of medieval images. I hope you enjoy them. Journeying with God is seen here in the life of Abraham, who was instructed to leave his home in search of the place to which God was calling him and learn to sacrifice short-term benefits for long-term rewards. Abraham's progress was a little unsteady, but he stuck with it, and that's why the Celtic monks who helped bring Christianity to England via Iona and Northumbria saw him as a prototype pilgrim and a key role model for their own faith journeys with God. Similarly, God is shown leading Moses and the Israelites through the wilderness to the land of Canaan. His presence is specially symbolized by the Ark of the Covenant, which you can see and is drawing on the right, is housed in a tabernacle, a splendid but portable place of worship. There was also the model of journeying to God. Once they settled in the land and Jerusalem had been captured, the temple which Solomon built there came to be seen as the place for special encounters with God and the focus of the great annual pilgrimages of Judaism. The temple, and this is a, a model which shows the glory of all the gold that was used, was like the tabernacle before, it was very carefully constructed, furnished with superlative craftsmanship and immensely costly materials, which together created a multi-sensory, immersive experience of glory and splendor which still influences our experience of pilgrimage today. The temple is depicted as being filled with abundant color, texture, fragrance, and sound. Priests were clad in very costly crimson, blue, purple, and gold vestments. Bronze, bronze, silver, and gold fittings reflected the light cast by lampstands. The air was full of fragrance of myrrh, cinnamon, and incense, and with sounds of praise. The sensory impact was maximized as people and priests moved through the spaces, made offerings, prayed, fell on their faces in awe. Sensory experience and generation of emotion are key to both tabernacle and temple, as they will continue to be throughout the story of pilgrimage. Human beings can only learn and understand and respond through their senses, which neuroscientists now think can number as many as 30, including the senses of movement. Emotions now also recognized as a key element in the creation of long-term memory and in decision-making and change. The Psalms, which became the heartbeat of Christian worship in the West, have at their core this combination of emotion, memory, and encounter with God, enhanced to a really carefully constructed communication of holiness. The temple and Jerusalem as a whole came to be seen as a place where God had chosen to dwell where he could be approached for forgiveness and other blessings in a special way. And the way the temple is described and used echoes those three elements of pilgrimage, revelation, encounter, and transformation. Revelation, teaching, the power and character of God through what is seen and done, 
communicating the sense of God's presence and the possibility of encountering him through the use of beauty, precious metals and jewels, and signaling through these sensory stimuli his holiness and evoking emotion, creating a sense of his power to encourage the fact and the belief that he can change people and groups. Both the tabernacle and the temple have left their mark on every Christian aim of creating special places for encounter with God. In the New Testament, however, we see a really different emphasis, also very important today. Jerusalem and the temple do feature in the Gospels, but there's a major shift. God's now present in a human being, he can be seen, touched, heard, and brings transformation. He is the revelation of God. So New Testament writers see the temple as obsolete because God is now available to everybody, first in birth of Jesus and then through the Holy Spirit. So who needs special places? This view is reinforced by the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans and the expulsion of most Christians and Jews from the city. And for the first three centuries of the church, the main meaning of the term pilgrim therefore became that of a Christian believer traveling towards life, towards the heavenly city of Jerusalem, described in the book of Revelation. It's a place of amazing beauty, lit by the very presence of God. Pearls, gold, glory, light, Jesus at the center. And as a result, New Testament writers address all Christians, all believers, as strangers and pilgrims, asking them not to um, sin, and also encouraging them that those figures of the Old Testament confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims. They too were on the back way to a heavenly country. It's vital to note, though, that labeling Christians as strangers and pilgrims, who are also citizens of heaven, is in no way an excuse to avoid commitment to this world. In fact, anything but. God's people are to serve and care, but with an underlying level of security and a set of external values, which means they can be radical and fearless in so doing, because they don't have all their eggs in this particular earthly basket, so they can stand up for what they believe is right, take risk, even if it costs them in the present. And this is woven through the early fathers of the church, um, such as um, Augustine, who defined Christian life as a pilgrimage towards heaven. For the first three centuries after Christ, there is no evidence that Christians venerated sites as holy or as places of special devotional experience. But of course, things didn't stay that way. The pendulum was about to swing in the opposite direction. In the fourth century came the conversion of the Emperor Constantine, whose pagan background meant he expected to have holy places and to mark them as splendid buildings. Constantine and his mother Helena therefore reinvented Palestine as a Christian holy land, creating great churches in Jerusalem and Bethlehem which conscious of Solomon's example, they filled with gold, silver, jewels, light and colour. Once again, beauty and the extravagant use of precious materials were used to create a sense of holiness in God's presence. Once again, we have the revelation of God's power and encouragement that he can be known in ways that will change lives. Bishop Cyril introduced immensely powerful liturgies and promoted the uniqueness of Jerusalem with superb salesmanship. Others only hear, he proclaimed, but we see and touch. He devised liturgies which employed multiple senses and acts of devotion, including pressing the relic of the cross. People were encouraged to relive, reenact enact biblical scenes in situ, and pray and worship in ways that triggered emotion and created powerful memories. Jerusalem was not only a place that in which it was made holy by past events, it became a setting where God could be encountered in the present. Egeria, a nun from Spain, visiting the land of the Bible in the late 4th century, describes a multi-layered, multi-layered, multi-sensory intensification of Christian experience in which profound emotion was triggered by recollecting together an event in the life of Christ at the very spot where it was believed to take place. When everyone arrives at Gethsemane, they have an appropriate prayer, a hymn, then a reading from the gospel about the Lord's arrest. By the time it has been read, everyone is groaning and lamenting and weeping so loud that people across the city can probably hear. 
But how did this heady mix, mix fit with earlier teaching? Significant voices raised concern. Gregory of Nyssa, most of the time, and Jerome, some of the time, insisted the pilgrimage to special places was unnecessary and even spiritually dangerous. And these developments did pose an inescapable theological conundrum. If some places were considered especially holy, then logically other places must be less so. And could it really be claimed that an omnipresent God was somehow more accessible in Jerusalem than in Britain? Jerome and Gregory, wearing their theological hats, both said no. On the other hand, Gregory himself shed tears when visiting Jerusalem, and Jerome was no stranger to intense sensory, emotion-packed devotional experiences in Bethlehem and Jerusalem. These otherwise stern fathers of the church are clear illustrations of the fact that when theology is ambushed by experience, experience tends to win out. But why? Quite simply, it's a factor of the way that human beings work. I spent a good many years working, examining the aspects of human physiology and psychology, which make us hardwired to find meaning in and attach meaning to places. And the importance of the senses in spiritual learning and response. These fundamental aspects of human nature provide one of the key reasons why pilgrimage has proved so hard to suppress when people have tried to do so. This model of encounter with God, so carefully constructed in Jerusalem, not only became very powerful within the Holy Land, but spread across Christendom through the reconstruction of buildings which created the same kind of sensory experience. Even in the early days of the church in Anglo-Saxon England, we see deliberate imitation of the sensory splendor of the tabernacle in the temple, as kings and bishops used precious metals and jewels and employed superb craftsmen to invoke the powerful sense of God's presence and holiness. During these early centuries, however, yet another form of pilgrimage emerged, as monasticism developed in the deserts of Egypt and Palestine. The desert fathers and mothers renounced homes and families for a life of prayer, accepting exile on earth to win sixpence in heaven. From the start, this way of life was seen as a specialized kind of pilgrimage in which inner journey could only be achieved by staying still. As a result of these developments, there existed from the fourth century onwards four main elements within Christian pilgrimage. One overarching concept, life as pilgrimage towards the heavenly Jerusalem, and three main strands of practical outworking. Interior pilgrimage, which includes monasticism and prayer and contemplation, and the mystical life, and seeking God in an inner Jerusalem. Moral pilgrimage, which is the calling of every Christian to do follow their calling to be obedient to care for the community and serve those around them. And place pilgrimage, involving journeying to saint shrines or other places to gain forgiveness, healing, or other material benefits, and to express devotion. That's very much about being mobile, leaving one's daily responsibilities and place of work, at least for a time. Clearly, there was quite a lot of room for these elements both to combine and to conflict. It's hard to be stable and mobile at the same time. And those who stressed inner pilgrimage were keenly aware of this. For them, there were three Jerusalems. The earthly city, the ultimate pilgrim place, pilgrim destination, the heaven city, the eventual goal of all Christians, and an interior Jerusalem. There aren't many people in the Middle Ages who tried to pursue all three. One who stands out was Marjorie Kemp the controversial merchant's wife, um, who travelled widely in the 15th century. Although she was much criticised, she did try to let her pilgrimage to places resource both her inner life with God and her daily life. So what did place pilgrimage offer in the Middle Ages? Ideally, though not always, it was designed to strengthen a person's daily relationship with God so it has to be said that some returned home needing more forgiveness than when they set off. Walking wasn't really a treat for the average medieval person. So unless you were doing specific penance, you would have ridden if you could, as these pilgrims are shown doing. But the journey to a shrine would have offered 
most people a rare break from work and a chance to explore the world. The emphasis was what on for them though was on what happened when they reached the goal and how it might change their lives. Our centre at York uses archaeological and archival evidence to create digital reconstruction of medieval shrines so we can get a better idea of what it felt like to be a medieval pilgrim. Like the tabernacle and the temple, these were places carefully designed to strengthen belief and encourage response. Places and objects have through the centuries played a major role in confirming Christian doctrine, whether being in Jerusalem or Oxford, seeing a fragment of the true cross or kissing the relics of the saint. These all made help make the stories of the Bible and saints' lives more concrete. At Canterbury in 1322, a visiting friar described the body of Thomas Beckett as resting in a case made of most pure gold and adorned with innumerable precious stones with shining pearls like unto the gates of the heaven of Jerusalem and sparkling gems. And this reconstruction shows pilgrims, real life stories of pilgrims, coming to the shrine to give thanks, to pray, and seeing the splendor made them realize that this was truly a place where heaven and earth intersect. Seeing was definitely believing. Nor were the other senses excluded. Bells rang, choirs sang music fit for heaven, tombs might exude healing oil or sweet smells, and above everything the pilgrims were moving, touching, crawling within sacred spaces, touching and being touched by them, literally and metaphorically. They might even drink or eat fragments of stone, dust, healing oil. All the senses with us at work together, and the offerings around shrines. There are grills all around the shrine, which helps create a sense of anticipation as you approach it. That's one of our findings. But on them are hung offerings, which people have left. A nightgown from a woman who has prayed for a child and received one. Crutches from those who've been healed. All of these objects help create faith, so the shrine was framed by answered prayer and encouragement to all who came. So powerful in terms of experience, medieval pilgrimage also had its weaknesses. For some, it was a substitute for daily closeness to God rather than aid to it and fail to feed back into everyday life. As such, it was very vulnerable to the criticisms which came to the fore of the Reformation when pilgrimage and associated practices became a major battleground and much of pilgrimage infrastructure was dismantled along with monastery. Despite much resistance, many buildings lost a lot of their light and colour and beauty and splendour and pilgrim journeys were actively suppressed. The reformers were determined to shine a fresh light on salvation by faith rather than by attempted good works, such as pilgrim journeys. Protestants teaching refocused on the New Testament pilgrimage as a journey through life, uh, which is most famously illustrated in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. And yet, as we saw earlier, it isn't that easy to suppress pilgrimage to places. And we get glimpses of good Protestant Englishmen traveling abroad, finding themselves, despite their theological convictions, being caught up in intensely emotional devotional responses to pilgrimage sites. In 1611, the son of the Archbishop of York, an outspoken critic of pilgrimage, unlike the present one, wrote of his visit to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, thousands of Christians perform their vows, offer their tears yearly, with all the expressions of sorrow, humility, affection, and penitence. It's a frozen zeal which would not be warmed by the sight thereof. Oh, that I could retain the effects it wrought. There were many other firm Protestants, who found themselves ambushed by the power of special places in succeeding centuries. One of my favourites is Robert Curzon, who arrived in Jerusalem in 1834. He wrote, It was curious to observe the different effect which our approach to Jerusalem had upon the various persons who composed our party. A Christian pilgrim fell down on his knees, kissed the holy ground. Two others embraced each other. As for us, we sat bolt upright on our horses and stared and said nothing. While the surrounders, the more natural children of the East, wept for joy, we who consider ourselves civilized and superior beings repressed our emotions. I would have got off my horse and walked barefoot to the gate, as some did if I had dared. At last, I blew my nose 
and rose slowly on. Clearly, he was overcome by emotion, but couldn't let it out. However, before much longer, Thomas Cook would both found modern tourism and revive pilgrimage to the Holy Land almost single-handedly, opening the way to secular and, sp and spiritual travel for millions. And pilgrimage, as we know, has continued to grow throughout the 20th century to the present day. So what does this whistle-stop tour of pilgrimage um, have to say to us today? These are the elements which formed together pilgrim experience, particularly to places, but not only to places. The pilgrim in connection with God, revelation, encounter, transformation. Are there ways of drawing together the various strands of pilgrim experience which were torn apart at the Reformation and allowing them to resource one another? As cathedrals and other pilgrimage destinations in this country revive or reinvent themselves to the pleasure of some and the horror of others, how can we evolve a theology of pilgrimage and place which works for us today? A few suggestions um, as I come to a close. You may have noticed that I have deliberately avoided the label holy places in talking about Christian pilgrimage today. That's because the term lies at the heart of the theological problem facing a faith which emphasizes the omnipresence and therefore the omni availability of God. People have fought and died over this one. To label particular places as holy can imply that they are qualitatively different from the rest of this world and that God is somehow more present or more accessible there. This clearly cannot be the case if we worship an omnipresent God and has led to all kinds of theological battles in the past. Yet many people, including a large number who don't have any form of religious belief, still find such places very helpful in and a helpful way into exploring spirituality and enriching their lives. That's not an accident, because that is in fact what these places are for, to make us pause, reflect and respond. This, these are the words of someone who came to Canterbury Cathedral as a visitor and left feeling that he had been turned into a pilgrim by his experience of the place. And social um, scientists and neuroscientists and architects are spending a lot of time thinking about the power of war, its effect on people, and the way that architecture, the way that buildings, as they did in the Middle Ages, as they still do today, can actually work on us and change us through the physical experience of exploring them. Buildings such as this beautiful um, shot of the crypt of Rochester show that we can, they can evoke in us whether we are come as tourists or as pilgrims or as worshippers, emotion or awareness of beauty, peace and holiness or something beyond ourselves. And in the research project I did for three years, people of all kinds, visitors of all kinds, said that they had almost a physical response, which turned into an emotional and often spiritual response to a place which they sensed had become special through time. So instead of thinking of places as a bone of contention, I think it's more useful to see them as a tabernacle and temple clearly were, as places with a special role essentially designed to communicate the holiness of God, to make us stop and pay attention, and create sensory experiences which draw us body, mind, and spirit into a deeper understanding of the greatness, glory, and goodness of God, and his desire for the relationship with us. The difference between these places and others, therefore, lies not in their essence, but in their purpose. They harness human creativity to point to the glory and creativity of God, and hint at what it's like to experience his presence. And it is they are no different to the wonders of creation that we experience when walking through a peaceful landscape, enjoying a world which is also designed, according to the Psalms, to show us God's glory and power and the beauty of his handiwork. So two deceptively simple questions remain unresolved. What exactly do we mean by pilgrimage and who qualifies to be called a pilgrim? 
After working on the theology, history and practice of pilgrimage for almost 25 years, I've concluded that it is unhelpful to have too narrow or too wide a definition. Sometimes there's an assumption that only those who walk to a distant destination with rucksack and hunting boots can be called pilgrims. Whereas in previous centuries, much of the emphasis was on the encounter with God, which waited at the goal, and many pilgrims were in fact locals. On the other hand, pilgrim can be something of a catch-all used to describe people who respond to sight in a manner satisfactory to those who manage them. In a meeting of cathedral deans in the 1990s, the limitations of this approach were admitted with the joke, I am a pilgrim, you are a visitor, he is a tourist. Trying to separate tourists and pilgrims fails to take into account the vital truth that any one person may experience a wide range of responses, sometimes unexpected, during a journey or while visiting a special place. From my own research and from years of trying to seeking to help cathedrals engage with visitors, I want to suggest a definition of pilgrim experience, which I think can work for both past and present. It is a state of openness to spiritual engagement through place and journey, whether planned or spontaneous, limited neither by mode of transport or the distance traveled. This encompasses those who travel with clear intent and those who may find themselves unexpectedly ambushed by and responsive to the power of place. If a pilgrim is a spiritually responsible, responsive person, then everyone is a potential pilgrim in whatever way they choose to pursue. One of our team sayings is scratch a pilgrim and you may find a tourist. Scratch a tourist and you may well find a pilgrim in the making. So to come back to my title, does the story of Christian pilgrimage demonstrate theology ambushed by experience? Yes, but in a good way. I want to suggest that increased understanding of the, that, of the power of that experience can actually enrich our theology because it tells us more about how human beings have been designed to function and respond. I suggest there is room within a wider theology of an omnipresent available God for special places, creative to tell us more about him and encourage us to pause and ask, where have I come from? Where am I now? And where am I going? We are fortunate to have many ways of being a pilgrim today, and some of them are scattered across this image. What unites them is the words of the centre, the core concepts of revelation, encounter and transformation. And what frames them is the theme of life as a journey towards heaven. Because it offers an ongoing story, into which all our ways of being pilgrims can be woven as we seek with quick renewal and refreshment for ourselves and encourage others to do the same. Thank you very much to Dee for that. That was really um, excellent. Uh, I'm just going to try to see if I get myself the right way up. I can. That's excellent. <laughs> All good. Uh, Dee, uh, we've got a number of questions coming in already in comments, but uh, can I just begin by um, asking you uh, quite a personal question, really? Um, what started your journey and your pilgrimage into this whole area of pilgrimage? Uh, how is it that you came across this as a research area at all? Well, I started um, a long time ago, um, actually before I probably went into academic life, working on a book on the Christian background of English literature. And when I'd finished that, because I was a clergy wife, I had children, I couldn't probably go into academic life at that point, I was asked if I'd like to embark on a PhD. And somebody said, what do you want to study? And within, without even thinking, I said pilgrimage, because the one image which I kept coming up against worked out in so many different ways in particularly in medieval spirituality was pilgrimage. But nobody ever seemed to step back and looked at what it actually meant or the different ways it could be interpreted. It was as if it was so omnipresent, nobody had actually noticed it. 
so that's what started the journey um, back in the early 1990s. So quite a long time ago. And I seem to have been um, involved in it ever since in different ways. Mm, thank you. And I wonder if I can just tempt you um, in, into something that's um, a, a different dimension, really. I mean, I would say pilgrimage is pretty common to all the world's faiths, I think, um, with the possible exception of Judaism. Uh, but even there, there are pilgrimage elements. If someone was putting you on the spot, I mean, just pretend for a moment I'm an undergraduate at the University of York. Um, what do you think it is that unites pilgrims of every faith, uh, spiritually uh, and humanly? I think the idea that our lives are a journey overall is something that's that's obviously just resonates with people and resonates with people who don't have any particular formal um, religious affiliation at all. I think the work I've been doing over the last few years, I've just published an enormous book on this subject, is looking at why it is that we seem to be hardwired as human beings, both psychologically and physiologically, that we do respond to, as people have been talking about today, to the experience of movement, that it does something to us, um, to our minds, our spirits, but also that as we arrive at um, places which I think have been designed to, to make us feel um, a, a revelation of, the, of, of God's character, um, frame some sort of encounter with him and enable us to go away with some sort of transformative experience. I think that we are, it, it just seems to be a universal um, that people feel that places should have meaning. They like to discover meaning in places. And we also like to um, create our own meaning and map those onto places. And one of the things that fascinated me when I was doing my theological training, I um, cunningly managed to turn most of my essays and dissertations to the subject of pilgrimage in one form or another. And I was really intrigued by what was happening then, this is some 20 years ago, as people, as the whole idea of place, of creating, as we see very often now, mini shrines, if somebody dies tragically, the automatic response now, the expected response, is that we create a small shrine to mark the place, or mark a place associated with that person. And I was really intrigued as to what was driving this. Much of the form of this is actually goes back to Christian practice of the past, but what's driving it is a sense of need today. And so I began to look backwards and forwards, right back to the start of Christian pilgrimage, um, but also trying to see how this worked out today and why it is. Um, and I've spent um, the last five years working particularly with cathedrals in this country, look, talking to visitors of all kinds, um, talking to staff, to volunteers, saying, what's happening? Why is this happening? What are people feeling? What are they seeking? And what's, what are they feeling they're taking away? Um, that matters to them? Why are they choosing Christian places to go and visit, even if they don't have any Christian background? They may be from Muslim faith, they may be from, in their own minds, no faith at all. Though I don't actually think people don't have any faith at all. I think we all have convictions and beliefs. But somehow this sense of place, meaning, encounter, possible transformation is something that just resonates with everybody. And I think it's a really important thing for the Christian church to, to explore more, which is why I've been trying to work on ways of looking at it that unite us in seeing the potential and the opportunity, um, rather than going back to the previous divisions that we've had. Thank you very much. So we've got some questions coming in, um, and uh, there are two or three comments as well, which I want to see if I can just sort of gather these together. Um, in a single question, but it, it just links, in fact, to what you were saying a moment ago about uh, what we might term roadside shrines, you know, when somebody's uh, tragically killed in um, uh, some kind of motor accident of some sort. Um, what you then find instantly almost is uh, springing up um, uh, flowers, messages, maybe candles, uh, quite often a cross and so forth. I'm very struck, I think, as a number of other uh, sociologists are, like uh, Grace Davy and uh, uh, Edward Bailey and others, uh, really about the sense in which um, the marking of these places and then the subsequent visits to them by those grieving or those who uh, 
have a particular affinity for the deceased, take on the character of uh, something that is spiritual and religious, which is actually beyond the control of the church. Um, and when one thinks about uh, the origins of some shrines, of course, one of the things that was uh, most difficult, I think, certainly for medieval Christianity, was that uh, some bishops simply couldn't control the proliferation of shrines. Mm -hmm. And if they couldn't control it, they couldn't tax it. Um, some of them did actually have theological objections. I thought it was superstitious nonsense, you know, effectively the equivalent, uh, as I was saying earlier, of a sort of, you know, kind of divine dating sort of thing, you know, that, um, you know, shrines to love and particular saints were a little more meeting places for divining, you know, who you might end up with eventually. But underneath that, there's something very rich and powerful, isn't there, about humanity uh, perceiving that there is divinity abroad, quite independent of, of the control of the church. And a journey and a shrine somehow seems like something that on the one hand is more significant and yet at the same time requires less life commitment, which is not to say pilgrims aren't giving life commitment. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you look at Chaucer's um, uh, Canterbury Tales, uh, not everybody on those uh, Canterbury Tales is what I might call a, a lifelong committed, uh, paid up disciple um, who's been on an alpha course and is uh, committed to supporting their parish through direct debit. Some of them are kind of on for the ride, aren't they, really? But it doesn't mean that something extraordinary doesn't happen to them and that God meets them in that journey. I just wondered if you could comment on the kind of the general effervescence of pilgrimage today. Yes, I mean, just to, just to go back to Chaucer quickly, um, that being my, some of my home territory, it is interesting that, as you say, the, the pilgrims are a very motley crew, um, but um, we tend to, and some of them have, definitely other reasons for traveling. You know, the wife of Bath is apparently on the hunt for a fifth husband um, rather than um, any major spiritual experience. But it is also interesting that one of the parts of the Canterbury Tales nobody much reads is the Parson's Tale, which begins uh, with the Parson, who is one of the few signed up and clearly spiritual people on the journey, saying, let me show you the way in this journey to the heavenly, to this, the voyage to the heavenly Jerusalem. So it's, it's very interesting it sort of pops up there, but because it's a prose um, text and it's not as much fun as the rest, sometimes it gets ignored. But I think that, um, I, I think yeah, having had the privilege of working with Grace Davy for a number of years now on, on, on various projects and other um, sociologists, social anthropologists, um, I've been learning a great deal about this. I think um, it's been very interesting for um, working together as historians, theologians and social scientists to really try and tease out what it is um, that people are seeking and needing. And I think one of the big things is that we may be in a, well, maybe we're in a post-Christian post society now. I don't quite know where we've got up to on this, but I think people still need ritual to frame their lives. They still need meaning. And if people don't have, uh, or don't use the ritual that's been handed down, then they start inventing their own. And actually, it very often mimics what's been there in the past. But it is really important that people have that. And I think we've seen a really good example of that with one of the, what I think is one of the worst effects of COVID, in that we haven't been able to have proper funerals and grieving processes. And this is an occasion where very often people who don't normally go to church do actually have the benefit of funerals taken by um, ministers and others and just a way of coming together of remembering a life of marking it and I think you know again baptisms weddings were suspended for a while and people I've heard of a lot of people um, I'm currently running a survey about the effect of COVID on on the community in general people are really missing that it's something we take for granted when it's there and we've really lost it it really it, there is a certain element of pain there because our lives need that. Our lives are a journey, but we don't want it to be just a vague drifting. We need to be able to mark the things that are important to us. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, yeah, it does, no, that's great, that's right. So I'm going to pick up another uh, couple of uh, questions here. One is we've just seen the, uh, the recent reconnection between Chartwell and Churchill, um, mm -hmm. which is um, you know basically a property that uh, is part of the Churchill family. 
Uh, I wonder if you could say what do you think is the difference between a visit to Chartwell and a visit to a cathedral? Well, as I started uh, with, a pilgrimage, you know, in the sense of being a special journey to learn about things and to to, to have an experience, um, is a word that's really um, worked quite hard these days. And I think a lot of people would say um, people go on pilgrimage to Graceland to uh, commemorate Elvis Presley. And actually, if you see the pictures of those, you actually light candles and you know have framed photographs of him. Now, I don't think, I haven't seen a uh, really launch of chart. Well, I doubt whether we've got candles in front of a picture of Winston Churchill. But I think there is a sense of um, rediscovering and remembering in a kind of secular way what's important to us. And Churchill obviously symbolizes many, many things to this country still. And I think, you know, I would brand that as a secular pilgrimage. But I think that there is a sense in which we can allow the word pilgrimage to have that special meaning. I think our problem when we're discussing Christian pilgrimage is that we need to have other elements to it. And I know if somebody's asked um, what my three key words were, they are revelation, encounter and transformation. And I'm sure that visiting Chartwell will have a transformative effect, but it won't have quite the same one as visiting um, a Christian holy place with certain attitudes and openness. Thanks very much. I'm uh, very conscious of that um, extraordinary American uh, uh, sociologist, uh, Cressida Creasy Dean, who talks about uh, uh, Generation Zedders and how you know their view of religion and God is uh, quite different now to perhaps what was around in the 1950s and 60s. And she says, if you're trying to characterize uh, a view of God today amongst uh, uh, perhaps sixth formers and undergraduates and beyond, you know, thinking perhaps of my own uh, sons here as well, uh, she, she says, um, uh, God is, uh, or, or religion is viewed as an African farm. Um, it has no fence. And uh, the only question is, is how far away from you uh, are you from the farmhouse? And are you journeying towards it or away from it? So again, you've got that journeying motif in there. And there's that sense in the world today of pilgrimage being an invitation to uh, almost amble through religious traditions. I, I know when I uh, taught in a different university, I'd often uh, start a course of lectures uh, in one particular subject with um, how many people in the room would say that they were religious and, you know, out of the, say, 100 attendees, maybe five or seven rather reticent people would half put their hands up, you know, in that kind of rather Anglican way, not going to fully put their hands up, but, you know, uh, half of it. But if you ask the question, how many of you are spiritual, it was very rare to have less than 85% of the room raise their hands. And then that was the rest of the lecture. What do you mean by spirituality? And for them, it was anything from music by Enya to uh, Enchant to uh, a sacred stone that they'd picked up by the shores of Iona, like a, a candle that they'd taken from Teze. Um, it could almost be anything, really. Uh, but it, these were always incredibly moving conversations. And they saw themselves as people who were quite at home in pilgrimage, actually. So no difficulty with that at all. What they, they didn't want to do was, was opt in to religion, but pilgrimage gave them permission to be spiritual. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. Um, again, going back to the uh, major research project I've been working on and some of the outcomes of that, I think the biggest message that we wanted to give to cathedrals as a whole was please don't categorize your visitors as they come in. Do not assume you know what's behind that exterior. Um, you don't know the needs that are there. I've spent a lot of time reading carefully um, anonymized prayers that are left as they are now in their hundreds and thousands at um, even Anglican cathedrals now. And the, the sort of the scale of human need that's under them. And I think in the past, um, people tend to think, well, you go to somewhere like a cathedral as a as a visitor, you're a heritage person, or you go as a worshipper, or you go as a pilgrim. And as I say, the, the, the biggest message we want to get across was, it's a person. It's not any one of those things. It's a person. And 
And what we found was, as we had many, many conversations with people and as we observed them carefully and, and sort of discreetly, was that anybody could find themselves shocked into a spiritual response by being in a particular situation. And again, one of my fav a favorite story is um, one of the um, guides, stewards at Durham, said she, she found a man walking down the central aisle of the cathedral in tears saying, I don't know what this place is doing to me. I'm a secular person. I'm a secular person. I don't do this. Um, and yet this place is getting to me. And I think that's tapping into that innate sense of the spiritual, which I think is part of the way we're created. So we may frame it in different ways, but it's there. And therefore, I think, you know, the ability to respond and the ability sometimes to surprise ourselves or just feeling ourselves in a place which gives us space, gives us quiet, gives us safety. There aren't many places where you can stop and just be in a safe way in this world at the moment. And that's one of the again, one of the losses of, of not having had churches and cathedrals open for a while during COVID, because historically that's the, that's where people go in time of emergency. And I've, again, I've had a lot of people coming back to me and saying, "I've so missed this. I don't normally go to church, but in a time like this, I would, because it's beautiful, it's peaceful, it gives me what I need, and I can stop and look at my life. I can get some perspective." And I can find the cope and comfort to move on. And I would want to say, I don't, I think you're absolutely right. I think everybody, most people would describe themselves as spiritual. Most people don't like the word religious or religion because they think it's formal, it's about rules, it's about it's about containing something that they want to be free. But that doesn't mean that people don't in fact want to explore spiritually and they, they want to find out what works for them, what will help them. And I think we are, we're doing ourselves a disservice if we don't see the idea of being a pilgrim as a way into offering something to people to explore in the way they want to, but with a very open-ended um, agenda um, that can, in which they can find whatever they need. And I found, again, um, a lot of um, people welcoming people to cathedrals were saying, oh, we're not actually even inviting people to worship. I've actually had um, colleagues and research students and others turned away from cathedral doors or attempted to be because they'd go and say, you know, I've, I've come um, for the service and I've had it explained in very simple words. No, 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 it's a service because they were under 30. So why would they want to come to a service? And this, they always had to fight their way in. And actually many young people, as we know from um, work that's going on, they started the problem with trust, absolutely love and respond to. Um, even song, other beautiful music. Um, so we need to be careful that we are not on the inside of the church, actually trapped in our own um, boundaries and our own sort of frameworks. And we need to realize that that freedom outside is something that people actually might want. We might be the ones shutting the doors or actually not welcoming them in um, to explore whatever pilgrimage can mean to them. Thank you for that. And, and, um, uh, there's, there's another question I want to raise in a moment, which is to do with uh, people coming in and being uh, treated and respected and welcomed, but not in, in an overwhelming way, uh, simply because they're uh, precious to God and loved by God, as we all are equally. So the, one of the questions picks up on this in terms of funerals uh, and, and the kind of correlation between what's being offered in a pilgrimage and what might be offered in, uh, you know, the pastoral offices like baptisms, weddings and funerals. But it strikes me as somebody who um, happens to live next door to a cathedral, that if I uh, go out in my civvies and I just watch people entering in to Christ Church Cathedral, I would say irrespective of their age, nationality, background, uh, faith or none, religion or none. The minute people step inside, their body language and behaviour changes. They go quieter, they tread softer, they walk slower, they gaze differently. And I observe a quite different body language to what, for example, they might do if they go into the Great Hall of Christ Church, um, where they're expecting, you know, a very grand Tudor dining hall and 
that quite a number of them are expecting to be able to take photographs of the model for Hogwarts Dining Hall as well. But the, the interesting thing about the religious space is that, of course, it's, it's saying something and doing something that's outside my control and your control. I can't tell people what this space is doing to them, and I can't tell people what a shrine will do to them. And one of the funny things, it seems to me, about the Reformation is that uh, uh, you know, elements of the church regain control over meaning, and they could direct that, and they could do it through belief and speech. But when you start to trust the aesthetics, the journey, the space, the art, the beauty, the atmosphere, you can't control how that impacts people. And that's why your example is so beautiful. You know, somebody walks into a cathedral and, of course, they're overwhelmed. It's nothing I've done or you've done. Um, there's no sign up at the beginning, is there, that says, you know, you're entering a space, be prepared to be overwhelmed, um, because that would be silly. Uh, you know, the, the, in a sense, the space does the work, the journey does the work, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think that's you know, one of the reasons I find it so fascinating to look at how from the beginning, you know, in terms of tabernacle temple, this is, you and I haven't done it, but it has been done. It has been deliberately um, created in that kind of way. And I mean, there is um, uh, a, a, a neuroscientist um, was saying that um, when you actually walk into a medieval cathedral and you look up, that actually does something to your brain and creates a sense of euphoria. And you have to look up because it's so beautiful. It's been created so that it makes you look up, up to the ceiling, up to the vaulting, etc. And to find yourself um, in this space, somehow held in this space, and yet overwhelmed by it. It's awe-inspiring. It's meant to be awe-inspiring. That's what I mean about, you know, the job of these places is to do just that. It is to make you think about God and respond. And it's not, it's intuitive. It's, it's it, it, instinctive. Um, it, it's not something, as you say, you can warn people before they walk in, but actually it will act upon people because that's what it's, it's meant to do. And I think that is something that we, um, it also works in small churches. Um, again, it's the beauty, it's the space, it's the peace. And I think these are things that we, we often crave as human beings, even if we don't know we do. Yeah. And you may not be used to it. And sometimes if you're not used to it, it can be quite scary. Um, but I think we need, um, we need to look at more about how we we both keep that wow factor, but also allow people ways to engage in a in a sensory way, in a more controlled and confined sort of a safer way. Because in a medieval cathedral like like yours, like many others, um, before the Reformation, it would have been full of small spaces, smaller altars, focal points, where people could have their own little space. Now they are beautiful, but they're quite vast and they're sometimes quite overwhelming. And um, we need to find ways of saying, here's a beautiful little chapel, come and sit in there and you can feel safe and protected and you can just be. And we need to open up our spaces in new ways, give people things to look at, which will communicate, even if they don't have Christian vocabulary and why should they? Um, all kinds of ways, give them things to do. Because again, um, a lot of the work I've been doing is so much about how we we need to learn by doing things. Um, one of the outcomes of our, uh, one of our projects was we held a day at Canterbury Cathedral, a sensory experience day. And we got people to do a number of things. But one of them, I think probably the most powerful, was we said medieval pilgrims used to come um, seeking forgiveness. Here are some post-it notes. Write on them things you're sorry for. Put them in a bowl of water. And they were written in special ink. So the words just disappeared and people were coming back to do it again and saying, wow, that is so cathartic. And people were doing it from seven year olds to 90 year olds. And we said, well, actually, that's kind of the message that God can wipe away sin, uh, wash away sin, literally. And they even wanted to take home the blank piece of paper, even though it was somewhat soggy from the water. But it was a way of allowing them to act out something which didn't actually mean a lot in theory, but once they actually acted it out, suddenly came to have real resonance. And I think a lot of medieval pilgrimage was about that. It had a lot for you to do. And going back to the question of the um, souvenirs, the um, pilgrim tokens and the tat question this morning, um, I think that's something that's still very powerful, um, that it, it, those things 
in, an, in earlier centuries encapsulated the experience and resourced the memory once you got home. And very interestingly, again, we found that Canterbury Cathedral has a shop inside and a big, very splendid shop outside. And people actually said to us, it means more if I buy it inside the cathedral, even if it's mm. the same thing, than it does when I buy it outside. And that's because it absolutely is then associated with the place. And somehow it takes you back to being in the place. And that, therefore, when you take it home, you share it with other people, you go back to it, then it, mm. it has that meaning. It takes you to where you were and what you experienced at the time. Thank you to you very much. That's a wonderful note on which to end. Um, I remember somebody asked me a couple of years ago, um, what was it that uh, in the cathedral that, that spoke about God that moved people so much? And I said, well, it's the space as a whole. And the way it speaks about God is this. It's just too much to take in. And when you proceed into a building like that, you suddenly realize that actually the problem we've had for 2,000 years is coping with the overwhelming abundance of God. Too much to take in, but a pilgrimage allows you to walk at a gentle pace around that and realize it's a lifetime and more. T, thanks hugely for everything. Uh, this has been a rich and stimulating time and uh, God bless you in your work. And uh, this also gives me an opportunity to say to all those watching that uh, this is uh, the last shout for the festival bookshop. Uh, there's free postage today uh, on a set of specially selected titles on pilgrimage and travel. And don't forget, we'll be back at 3.15 for our open forum discussion with Sally Welsh. But thank you for joining us and have a good short break and a cuppa. Thank you.
Hello, everybody, and welcome to the last session of the day. Um, just before we go into this, I thought I'd mention, since uh, Dee was talking about her work with cathedrals, I thought I'd just mention the Pilgrim Passport, um, which is something some of you may be aware of. This um, was, was partly the work of um, a member of our cathedral team. It's a little publication people can buy and get stamped when they visit different um, cathedrals around the country. So if you haven't seen that one, you might like to look out for it. Um, and now in this session, it's great to be here with Sally again. Um, if you have only just joined us, Sally Welsh is Vicar of Childbury in West Oxfordshire. She's also the Diocesan Spirituality Advisor and a, a prolific writer and um, somebody with a great passion for pilgrimage. Um, she's been working with us here at the Cathedral on a joint project exploring pilgrimage and how we can um, make the most of it in our offer to people who come here. Um, this is a chance in this session for you to send in any questions that you'd like, particularly on the kind of practical side, what, how we run pilgrimage in practic practical ways. Um, but before we have questions from you, I'll just ask Sally to say a little bit about some of the project we've been working on jointly. Thank you, Sarah. Um, as and as with all these projects this year, we've got a before lockdown and post lockdown plans. So before lockdown, we were going to have another one of our pilgrimages to the shrine of St. Friedswide in Christchurch. We did the first one, very first one last year, and um, people were invited to walk about 10 miles, so a day's journey from four or five different locations around the diocese. And so to come from all those different places and gather in the cathedral for a short service and tea, obviously, because it's an Anglican cathedral, but also to um, engage with the holy space, the sacred space of the cathedral by means of various different prayer stations. We had a wonderful time, about 400 people um, engaged with us. Um, and we were going to do that again this year, but but we can't. So instead, we have been working on a project using VoiceMap, which if you don't know what that is, it's an audio tour. So you um, it's access through, your, through an app on your phone. And um, this particular audio tour runs from um, Godstow, the Godstow Abbey, into, into Christchurch Cathedral. So it's about a four mile walk and you access it with your on your phone and then you get my voice commenting both on the landscape and offering reflections on Psalm 23, which um, we hope is a, a kind of substitute to that, that gathering that we are unable to do this year, but have great plans for doing another surprise wide pilgrimage next year. Obviously, we were going to have um, an embodied festival of Christian pilgrimage. But on reflection, this, this one day sort of short course pilgrimage festival, I think, has been a really good starting point for further conversations about pilgrimage and how we can use it, not just in cathedrals and doing grand journeys, but in our local spaces, using our local landscapes, local churches. And finally, um, um, this is this is project has project, um, um, really been spurred on really by uh, the lockdown. Uh, is the development of our Christian pilgrimage website, which we hope will be a um, a resource not not just where where we can say, "Look, guys, this is what we're doing," but where everybody can share their resources and their responses to pilgrimage and the things that they have been creating and make that a real hub for focus on Christian pilgrimage. And if you're not excited, that's, you know, that's what you should be. Should be. I, I think it would be great if, um, if we could just put up a slide uh, showing the pilgrimage uh, website, just so that you can note, if you haven't already, thank you, we can note the um, address. So do have a look at that. It's just gone live last week. And there's still, you'll see if you have a look, there are some areas still for development. Um, but that is deliberate because we want to add to it. And we're going to add the talks from today um, to the site in the next week or so. Um, bear with us while we get that sorted. Um, and we're also working uh, with colleagues in the diocese and elsewhere to add different resources. 
Um, and Sally, one of the things that we've talked about doing that I think we're very keen on this idea of how to be a pilgrim friendly church. I just wonder if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yes. Some years ago, there was um, an initiative in the Diocese of Oxford. I don't know if it was beyond as well, Diocese of Oxford and beyond, on being a child friendly church. And in order to be a child friendly church, you had to provide a number of resources that would help small children and anybody who's involved with their care. Things like um, spare nappies and a changing mat and, it, and drink and things like that. And we thought one of the what a good thing it would be if we if churches could be encouraged to be pilgrim friendly. So actually offer some of the things that pilgrim fire pilgrims find really helpful on their arrival at a church or a sacred space or a cathedral. So I'm hoping those of you that are still engaging in this in this festival that um, some kind of ideas and comments and suggestions for things that can be part of a pilgrim friendly church, bearing in mind that not every church is able to offer toilet facilities. Not every church is even able to offer running water, but just some of the essential things that can be provided to be a welcome for pilgrims. Even, even if it's perhaps something like um, um, a way of, a creative way of interacting with the, with the holy space, the sacred space that is the church building. So, so we we'll left it, it on the website, on the website really because really. we're waiting for your input. I think um, another thing that's certainly some of the questions that came in earlier today um, have all been about how people, this is great, we talk about these wonderful roots and people's interesting experience, but how we can respond to the ideas um, at a very local level. Um, and Sally, you um, have just come to the end of a, of a deanery project where you worked with your deanery in rural West Oxfordshire um, to help all the local churches uh, provide something um, along the lines of pilgrimage. And I wonder if perhaps you could share some of those practicalities because I think people will find that really helpful. Yes, I mean, it's a, we called it the Pilgrim Paths Project and it really came about because I was made, rather reluctantly made area dean and wanted a project that we could all, all the churches in the deanery could engage with and it's something that brought the deanery together and something that actually energised and engaged everybody, but also used all the advantages and the resources that we have. It's Chipping Norton Deanery, which is a small rural deanery. We have 32 churches, but we also have fantastic landscape, countryside, some beautiful churches and a network of footpaths. So essentially we began by looking at our favourite walks, really, circular walks. The only stipulation was that they had to start from a church and include one other church so that it would be circular. I'm just going to check. Oh, my God. Um, Sarah, do you want to talk about something else while I leave StreamYard? Sorry, we're having some issues with... With the, with the, uh, okay, please bear with us for a moment just while we try and sort out some technical issues. Um, another um, thing that we've been working with, with, with the cathedral, the cathedral with Sally is trying to look at our cathedral through the eyes of a pilgrim. We have in normal circumstances um, hundreds and thousands of visitors every year who come and visit our cathedral as part of visiting Christchurch. And I think it's fair to say that some people, when they arrive at the cathedral, they're, they're still sort of in Alice in Wonderland or Harry Potter land, because that's why they come to Christchurch, because we're a very unusual sort of place, as you may be aware. And we want to make sure that when people step over the threshold and come into um, the cathedral, there's some sort of sense of, of a sort of different place and a different story. And Martin's already talked very powerfully about that, how you see people step in and the body language change. Um, so we've been trying to make our cathedral um, speak of pilgrimage um, and, and provide more resources to help people reflect and understand something of the pilgrim journey. It, it is quite tricky, I have to say. There are many barriers to encounter with Christchurch Cathedral. Um, 
one of them being finding the way in. And that sounds really silly, but we're quite kind of hidden away um, right in the middle of, of, a, of a college in the middle of Oxford. And it's not always for, easy for people to get across the threshold. So we're trying to break down other barriers um, so that people really feel they can come in. And also working with the diocese, that was part of our thinking behind um, setting up this big St. Fried's Wide pilgrimage, um, which we did for the first time last October around St. Fried's Wide's Day, was very much feeling actually a lot of people in our diocese, which covers the three counties of Oxfordshire, Berkshire and Buckinghamshire, it's a huge area, um, don't actually ever come to the cathedral and actually quite honestly some of them don't even know where it is. Um, so we are trying to break down some of those barriers and a really good way of getting people in is through pilgrimage because it seems to have such resonance um, in contemporary culture. Now the good news is I think Sally is now able to rejoin us, which is great. We were talking more about um, pilgrimage in the rural church. And I think one of the things that struck me, Sally, particularly thinking at the moment about um, some of the pressures that are on churches, particularly in COVID times, people are very worried about money. And I think people sometimes think when you're setting up a project, you need lots of funds. I think you did some incredibly creative things with, with quite small budgets. And I wonder if you could talk about some of the kind of really simple, practical things you did to make your Pilgrim Project work um, in your deanery? I think the most important thing was to get everybody involved. So we had enthusiastic walkers, we had um, A-level students drawing the pictures for the maps. So in our guides, we had, um, obviously we did, if you use ordnance survey maps or, or published maps, then you have to, you get into copyright issues. So we had students and architects and all sorts of people drawing the pictures, drawing out the maps. We included the route instructions as well as the reflections in the book. So you only needed one booklet. And you can see examples of them on the website and, um, and download them and, and have a look at them for yourself, actually, and see. We, I mean, we're quite happy with you using some of the reflections for your own routes and stuff like that, because the whole purpose of the website is, as I said, to be a resource hub so that anyone can engage with it um, and, and also take from it what they need. I think when you look at the website, you'll see just how good all the material is from um, Sally's Deanery, which is great. It's a very good example, but it's also, it, it shows that you can do it quite simply, I think. Um, but we would love that map that's on our website, not just to be this one corner of West Oxfordshire. Um, it isn't about a territorial land grab, it's about making it as wide open as we can. Um, Sally does also run, through Christchurch, runs a, a, um, a network of people interested in pilgrimage. And if you'd like to... Um, be involved in that, do let us know, um, send us an email, or have a look at that website and contact us through that, you'd be most welcome. Um, yes, and somebody's just asking on the chat, are the walks available? And the answer is yes, they are, they're on the website. Um, there's another question in saying, many churches along the Camino have someone available to offer a pilgrim blessing. And do we have that at Oxford? Um, and the answer is, um, part of the answer to that is that our pilgrim project did look at the kind of welcome we give people our visitor officer is very keen on um, pilgrimage herself and has men made many pilgrimages. And so we do very much, we try and welcome people in that intentional way um, and make sure the clergy are, are welcoming and sympathetic, um, which of course they are. Um, and we also have a lovely stamp, which we put in people's pilgrim passport or whatever else they're carrying, because it's really important. People really like collecting a record of their of their pilgrimage. Um, and, and I know as a pilgrim myself, that's been really important when you get to another point. Sally. Yes, I just wanted to add, it's it's not only about the pilgrim blessing when you get to the end of your destination, but one of the things we have found people have appreciated is having a guide on your pilgrimage with you. So there was a lot of conversation in the at the beginning of our sessions about the difference between walking on your own and, and walking in a group. Um, and walking on your own, you can do both with the both with voice map and with the Pilgrim Paths project guides. But one of the things we have been offering in past years is actually having somebody lead the walk. So you say the reflections, you say the prayers together, but there is somebody adding 
um, something else to it, maybe their reflections, maybe some of their own prayers, maybe just being a companion along the walk for people who perhaps aren't as used to going on, on pilgrimage. You may well know this event today was supposed to be the first day of a two-day residential conference and we would love in the future to be able to invite you here to Christchurch for exactly that kind of thing. Um, but we thought we hadn't given up the idea altogether of people being able to come here and spend some time. And we do have a plan uh, next year in Holy Week to hold a retreat here at Christchurch that would be themed around pilgrimage. Um, we haven't announced the details yet. As, as everybody knows, life is, is very provisional at the moment, but we're working on that. Um, if that's something you'd be interested in, if, that, if, that's, if that's something you'd be interested in, I was talking about the fact that we're hoping to set up a retreat here at Christchurch um, in Holy Week uh, next year. And if you would be interested in that, um, please do let us know through the website or drop us a line and we can tell you more about it. Arrangements are still a little bit provisional because everything is at the moment with COVID, but we hope that's something that will fill the gap of, um, of that's been left by not being able to meet together on this occasion. Sally, there's a question here about um, whether it's important to have a spiritual director if you're doing a group pilgrimage. Perhaps you could answer that. I'm not sure what you mean by spiritual director. It is, it is quite helpful to have a leader who has firstly walked the route so they know where they're going. When um, I was part of a group that, that led the pilgrimage across the diocese and pilgrimage across the diocese of Oxford along the Thames path. And I must have walked that route four times before I considered myself qualified to lead the bishop and a hundred of um, his parishioners across uh, along that route. And similarly, doing the voice map walk, um, I have walked from Godstow Abbey to Christchurch, I don't know, about a dozen times. So you need to know where you're going if you're going to lead the group pilgrimage. But I think also um, you don't need to have any theological qualifications, but you perhaps it, it is helpful if you have been able to reflect on what you want to say, whether you're going to pick up um, how the landscape resonates with journeys, with spiritual journeys, whether you're going to um, reflect on a psalm. Some of the pilgrim paths pick up a psalm and spend the journey reflecting on different verses of the psalm. Um, just really what your main theme is going to be and what you want to share with the people you are leading. Some of the pilgrimages I have led have actually had no relationship with the landscape at all, but have simply illustrated the history of pilgrimage. So I've, we've begun at the beginning with the, the, the kind of the journey to the tomb and ended up at our destination point with um, a reflection on what contemporary pilgrimage feels like and looks like. I think... I think uh, thinking about, I speak from experience, Sally and I have been jointly, um, we have led groups together and there is a certain number of people at which point it is really useful to have, as well as a leader, to have um, what we might call a gopher, um, somebody who is a backstop, someone who can look after anybody who's falling behind a little bit, um, somebody who can perhaps spot problems. I don't know, Sally, whether you think there is a magic number um, but I know that you have on occasions taken your husband with you or you've taken me or, or kind of other volunteers um, from your own deanery. But I think sometimes this is very helpful, isn't it, to have somebody looking after some of the practicalities. Yes, absolutely. And I think the magic number is the number of people you can shout past, really. So if you can stand at the front of your your walk, if they're in, walking in single file and the person at the back can hear you, then that's okay. If they can't hear you, then, then you need more people in between. Um, there was also a question earlier about families, taking families on pilgrimage. I first got into pilgrimage because we had, we had three children very close together and then a 10 year gap and then child number four arrived. And so we had a wide ranging family and and zero money and we needed something to engage the whole family and I had been 
beginning to look at active prayer and, and walking as a form of prayer. And um, so we took the whole family on pilgrimage and the oldest was, I think, 12 and the youngest was six months old and I carried him on my back and we had a, a fantastic time. It's, it's a kind of cheap holiday because you sleep in very basic places and you eat whatever you can find in the shops along the way and, and you don't stop to go on anything or do anything. So um, it, it met all the criteria. So, and my youngest son on more than one occasion has said one of the reasons he likes pilgrimage is that he can talk to all sorts of people. So you all ages can talk to each other in a, in a way that, that, that doesn't, often, doesn't often happen nowadays. So, you know, you can talk to people and also if you want to stop talking to them, you can just walk faster or more slowly. So that's really interesting. It's very good. Um, it's a very good intergenerational activity, isn't it? Um, if I could just pick up a couple of questions. Somebody has asked about the retreat. Um, and, and yes, we will um, let people who've registered for today's event, we'll let you know when the details of that retreat are ready to go. Um, so that it's, if that's something you'd like to book into, you get the chance to do that. Um, and then here we've got a question, Sally, about eco pilgrimage. Um, and is that could that be a good way forward um, to get people involved in eco theology and and activity around the climate change emergency? Any thoughts on that, Sally? Absolutely, I I think it is an incredibly powerful way because once again you are you are immersed in the landscape if you are walking through it. And you become very aware of the effect of human beings on the landscape from the evidence that you see and that you have the opportunity to examine very closely. Um, there was a, a, a green pilgrimage network that that I think is slightly more abundant at the moment. I'm not quite sure, but I think I think um, eco pilgrimage is a is a very powerful and a, has got a great deal of potential. Yes, yes, because I mean you're incredibly exposed to the environment, to the landscape. I just wonder, I mean, it's something all our speakers have touched on really, um, but you're, Sally, you're someone who's been passionate about pilgrimage and writing about it for many years. I just wonder what you personally have learnt about pilgrimage since COVID-19. Are there any sort of specific things that have evolved for you in the last six months? Um, the first thing I had to get over was uh, but that, that feeling, as all of us must have had, of, of being trapped and of the extreme disappointment of having my um, planned pilgrimage through Jordan and the Holy Land cancelled and having to make plans instead, which I have for in October, for um, St Cuthbert's Way upon which clearly um, I am in great company. It's the Archbishop of York is also planning to walk St Cuthbert's Way, but it's all the same. It, it's not quite the same. So learning that, getting over that. But as I said earlier this morning, when talking to the, to the Bishop of Norwich, I think that whole making the, having to make the same journey again and again and again, both in the early parts of lockdown when we could only exercise from an hour and from our own homes, walking to my other church and back, and also working on the voice map pilgrimage, walking from Godstow Abbey to Christchurch quite so many times. And you think it might be just impossibly boring, but actually every time is different. And getting really fully engaged with a very small part of the landscape um, has been very powerful, actually, yes. So, so what of that do you think you'll take forward or is it going to be just a huge sense of relief when we're back to some kind of, I'm assuming we are back to what we call the old normal um, next year, for example. Do you think, what are the things that will be long lasting for you? I think the, the Pilgrim Paths lesson of making small local journeys regularly as kind of part of the, the, the daily habit or weekly habit of pilgrimage. So it's not all focused on the long journeys, the big trips, but actually on the small everyday ones. And 
And I think they're a great help in actually bringing pilgrimage spirituality into our everyday life if we continually re-engage with the action of pilgrimage. Um, but, but also remembering all those things that we have learned, the mindfulness, the traveling light, um, and the sharing the journey with strangers and fellow pilgrims. Great, thank you. Um, we've nearly got to the end of the questions that have come in. Mm -hmm. um, just to say that, yes, a number of people have been asking whether these um, talks will be available afterwards, and yes, they will. Um, everything will be available through the Church Times YouTube channel in sort of almost immediately. And then in due course, we'll make sure that it all goes onto the website that we mentioned earlier. Um, just a final reminder, I think you'll have time if you do it by the end of today. If you want to order any books um, from our festival bookshop, there's free P&P for today only on a carefully selected um, group of titles to do with pilgrimage and journeying and I think and travel. Um, so do have a look at that um, and see if there's anything that you'd like to order. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Sally for an, another point she wants to make. <laughs> just, just reminding you, do have a look at the website. Um, and do do have a look at voice map. Have a look, um, you don't have to walk from Godstow Abbey to Christchurch to hear the commentary, but you might want to just have a look at that and see how it might you might be able to use it in your own context. Yeah. Oh, the links on the website. At this moment, I would like to um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, huge thanks to our speakers. I should also thank the speakers who very graciously stood down. This was going to be a two-day event and we had to sort of slim it down um, and, and they were very understanding and we very much hope to invite them back another time. Um, but thank you to all those who've contributed today. I'm going to hand you over to Martin, who's going to um, just end with, with a little reflection um, just, to, just to finish off. Uh, I want to express enormous thanks to uh, Sally and Sarah for putting today on and for bringing us together and to uh, Church Times and to all our sponsors and to um, the uh, Church Times um, organisers as well behind this and uh, so many others as well. It's been um, a remarkable day and very rich and thank you again to all our speakers. Just to close this, I particularly want to uh, just uh, read a couple of passages, one from uh, Abbe Henri de Tourville, which was written in the late 19th century, and then some work from Richard Roll. This is all very much about the journey and the pilgrimage of life being a pilgrimage of love. Richard Roll first. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to develop in me your lover, an immeasurable urge toward you, an affection that is unbounded, a longing that is unrestrained, a fervour that throws discretion to the winds. The more worthwhile our love for you, all the more pressing does it become. Reason cannot hold it in check. Fear does not make it tremble. Wise judgment does not temper it. There is no one more blessed than he who dies, because he loves so much. No creature can love God too much. As I was thinking about pilgrimage earlier today, and particularly in the light of the talks that we've heard, I thought about the journey to shrines and holy places, and I thought very much about the things that we leave there. Maybe thinking of that moment where you write things on post-it notes in ink and drop them in a basin or a bowl of water, and they melt away. Pilgrimages are about leaving our burdens behind, about leaving those things that we want to leave with God, and return home changed and transformed, free and redeemed, knowing that in our journey and in our return, God has changed us. Abbe Henri de Tourville 
wrote this in 1895. Do not keep account with our Lord and say, I did him such an injury, therefore he owes me such a grudge. He cannot be on good terms with me because I have not paid him for this or for that. It would not be just otherwise. Go bankrupt. Let our Lord love you without justice. Say frankly, he loves me because I do not deserve it. That is the wonderful thing about him. And that is why, in my turn, I love him as well as I can without worrying about whether I deserve to be allowed to love him. He loves me although I am not worthy. I love him without being worthy to love. I know of no other way of loving God. Therefore, burn your account books. You may say, I love him and yet I constantly offend him. How can these two things go together? You actually ask me how these two things can go together in human nature, in this nature of ours, which is continuously full of contradictions. We will always offend God in some way. That is only one reason the more for making amends, both to yourself and him, by loving him always and forevermore, constantly seeking him who has already found you. You want to compete with his affection before you've understood it. That is our mistake. Come then, show some deference to our Lord and allow him to go before you first. Follow him. Let him love you a great deal, a very great deal, long before you have succeeded in walking with him or loving him even a little as you might wish. And so wherever you are in this journey and your own journey today, and wherever you are in your pilgrimage of life, may God bless you and keep you. And may God grant you company and grace and wisdom for the journey ahead and keep you in the apple of his eye and in the palm of his hand and in the warmth of his embrace. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you all this day and forever. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. Thank you for being with us. 